tell me when. You could go ahead and start. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the August 25th, 2020 Vista Consolidated Meeting. Meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being conducted utilizing teleconferencing and electronic means consistent with the State of California Executive Order N-29-20. In the event a quorum of the City Council loses electrical power or suffers an internal or an internet connection outage that is not corrected within 10 minutes, the meeting will automatically be adjourned. Any items noticed as public hearings will be continued to the next regularly scheduled of the City Council. Any other items on the agenda that the council has not taken action on will be placed on a future agenda. And that's if we would lose electrical power or suffer an, an internet connection outage that isn't corrected in 10 minutes. That, that's what that is about. So with that, I'll have a roll call by our city clerk, Kathy Valdez. Thank you. Mayor Ritter? Here. Deputy Mayor Rigby? Here. Councilmember Franklin? Here. Councilmember Green? Here. Councilmember Contreras? Present. All members are present. Also joining us are City Manager Patrick Johnson and City Attorney Daryl Piper. Okay, um, in accordance with the Brown Act, I'd like to announce that as a result of convening simultaneous meetings, the members of the Buena Sanitation District will receive compensation of $147.75 for the district meeting pursuant to Buena Sanitation District Ordinance 2006-1. And uh, for the Zoom, for members of the public that are participating through Zoom, you may raise your hand to indicate you'd like to speak by clicking the raise hand feature on your screen or by pressing star nine on your phone. Instructions on how to join the meeting through Zoom are provided on the agenda cover sheet. Staff will be lowering everyone's hand now to start the meeting. And we will announce when to raise your hand to indicate um, you would like to make a comment on the specific item being discussed. You may only speak on an item once and public comment is limited to um, three minutes. So um, with that, we'll have the approval of the agenda by city manager, Patrick Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. There are no ch changes this evening to the agenda. Okay, we have three presentations this evening and um, the proclamations recognizing the recipients of the 2019 City of Vista Employee Awards. And so the first one is um, for our employer, employer, employee, Laura Meads, who was recently recognized as the recipient of the City of Vista 2019 Mayor's Excellence in Service Award. Um, whereas Laura is the voice of the city to every single person who calls in. She's the first person they have contact with. And as such, she's the first impression they have about our organization. Laura is the attentive ear that assists in the most customer-friendly way. She's always cheerful, positive, and absolutely delightful, not just in her interactions with the public, but also internally with employees. Not only is Laura the first person the public interacts with over the phone, she's also the face of the Human Resources Department when an employee comes into HR. She greets them by name, making them feel welcome and comfortable. Over the few years she's been with the city, she's built relationships so that when an employee comes to HR, she almost always knows something about them personally and is able to say much more than a simple hello. So now therefore the mayor and members of the Vista City Council congratulate Laura Meads on being chosen as the City of Vista 2019 Mayor's Excellence in Service Award recipient and do hereby proclaim Wednesday, August 26, 2020 as Laura Meads Day in the City of Vista. And with that, where is Laura? Yay, we can clap for Laura. And is she on? Are we have her on here? Yeah, Laura's on. Hello. You want to say something? I do. I just want to say thank you so much. I'm extremely honored. Um, it's amazing what the city does for their employees. I feel appreciated every day. Um, I'm. I feel welcomed, and my whole HR office helps support me. I couldn't do what I I do if it wasn't for them. And to be honored for just doing my job is amazing. And. I also couldn't ask for better bosses. Dolores and Anna, they're the best bosses a girl could ask for. They support me and give me confidence every single day. And I truly, truly appreciate this. Thank you. Congratulations, Laura. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Yay, so um, our next award um, goes to Chris R.C., Manager of the Year. And whereas Chris was recently recognized as recipient of the City of Vista's 2019 Manager of the Year Award. 
whereas Chris Arce is a public works operations manager and is responsible for the streets, stormwater, and park divisions overseeing 20 personnel. Under Chris's leadership, the parks division won three grants, two grants to plant, maintain 550 trees, and one grant to remove up to 150 dead disease trees, a first for the city. These grants totaled more than $500,000. And whereas the streets stormwater division has completed many special projects throughout the city in addition to their day-to-day -day duties. These special projects include retaining walls, fences and gates, drainage projects, curb gutter sidewalks, removal of homeless encampments and blight reduction throughout the city by working with retail vendors and being a member of the city's homeless task force. Whereas Chris has led the efforts uh, for improvement of the city right of way along the SR 78 corridor by landscaping open, air, open areas and building relationships with many agencies and neighboring cities to assist Vista with blight eradication and maintenance projects. And whereas Chris's efforts to improve the sidewalk maintenance with new techniques and incorporating GIS surveys is having results to better assist our residents and visitors. Whereas Chris makes himself available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond to issues throughout the city. He's also been innovative in executing his work within a limited budget. The staff respect him for his honesty, his hard work, character, and genuine compassion. Chris has assisted many employees as they further their education plans, and he's won scholarships for employees and coordinated staff participating in public agency events. He's a team player, presents himself well in meetings, and continues to significantly contribute to the improvement of the Public Works Department. So now, therefore, the mayor and members of the Vista City Council congratulate Chris Arce for being chosen as the 2019 City of Vista Manager of the Year, and to hereby proclaim Thursday, August 27th, as Chris Arce Day in the City of Vista. Congratulations to Chris. Yay. <laughs> and uh, we have Chris on here. Yes, we do. Yes, Chris is here. Would you like to say something, Chris, maybe? A few words? Chris, you're on mute. Hmm. Are you there yet? No, I, I don't think his uh, microphone's working correctly, Mayor. Oh, no, Chris. Well, congratulations to you. We appreciate doing all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so then I guess should we move on to the next one, I guess? Yes. Okay, so then we'll move on to Aldo Hernandez. He's Employee of the Year. So was recently recognized as a City of Vista 2019 Employee of the Year. Stormwater lead maintenance worker with a crew of three. He is also in charge of the inspection and maintenance of the MS4 system, as well as the inspection and maintenance of 57 permitted stormwater sites. Last year, Aldo Hernandez led his crew in the repair of a storm drain pipe that was severely corroded, causing a sinkhole on New Year's Eve. On New Year's Eve, that had to be tough. <laughs> Not celebrating doing that. The sinkhole developed on Foothill Drive, a very highly traveled road that served the entry and exit out of Vista. All this crew completed the repair within five days with minimal traffic delays to drivers during the holiday period. This emergency project was a success thanks to all those good planning and coordination with other crews that assisted him with traffic control and hauling of equipment and materials. Whereas most recently, Aldo led his crew in the removal and installation of old failing 707 766 foot long French drain system on country, Countrywood Lane. Engineering received contractor bids for $92,000. Due to the high cost, engineering reached out to Stormwater to repair the pipe. Aldo quickly planned and scheduled the job and was done within five days with a total cost of $5,000 in material. The completion of the drain repair was vital to engineering as the drainage issue needed to be addressed prior to the scheduled street paving program. Whereas Aldo also played a key role in the trash and homeless encampment removal project that took place in the Hacienda Drive Biological Preserve open space. This project presented some challenges, one which was how to transport enormous amounts of trash across an active running creek that was steep, slippery, and hard to maneuver through. Aldo came up with a system that consisted of tying a rope to a tree, then pulling it with a backhoe arm to create tension. 
followed by adding a pulley to the rope to pull the trash across the creek. This avoided crews having to walk across the creek, facing the possibilities of slipping, falling, and injuring themselves. This system also sped up the cleanup and kept all the workers safe. Aldo and his crew also assisted the wastewater division to build a new easement road, which now allows the travel of city and sheriff vehicles to patrol this area to keep it free of blight and homeless encampments. And whereas Aldo has also proven himself as an effective leader of his unit, he's very well respected and works as hard as every member of his crew. He positively contributes to the public works department with innovative ideas and a can-do attitude. His work, work ethic, um, integrity, and dedication to the department make him worthy of this award. So now, therefore, the mayor and members of the Vista City Council congratulate Aldo Hernandez on being chosen as the City of Vista 2019 Employee of the Year recipient and to hereby proclaim Friday, August 28th, 2020 as Aldo Hernandez Day in the City of Vista. Congratulations to Aldo. Appreciate it. Aldo, what do you do? You want to say a few words? Yeah, well, I just want to say uh, it, 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 it's always it's always good to have a good crew around you. If it wasn't for my guys working around me and giving it 100% all the time, um, things wouldn't get done. And also with having good management, uh, with the support of the good management, also putting a lot of trust in me, uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody for all that. You're welcome. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you do for Anybody else want to say anything? Thank you. Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to echo congratulations to all of our award recipients. Uh, we have a great staff. We are told constantly by our constituents as well as colleagues and staff from other cities who might try to poach but don't do it. Uh, we have a great staff and it's an honor to work with them. And especially during these times, which are a little bit more difficult than we might normally have, everybody has really stepped up to the plate and it has not kind of noticed. So I want to say thank you to our award winners. And I don't know how you decide who wins these awards because everybody does a great job. And I just want to say thank you all. Thank you. I agree. It's very difficult to pick any one person, but they, they, all, are, they all do a great job. Our, we have great employees in the city of Vista. So um, seeing no other hands waving at me, I will, I guess we will move on then to our city manager, Patrick Johnson. He's going to provide our COVID-19 update. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, just a very brief update on COVID-19, primarily relating to the county and the state. Uh, I think, as you all know, the county has reached its metric that allows it to be removed from the state watch list which means that it must maintain a certain status for 14 consecutive days. This will allow for the K through 12 schools to reopen uh, physically if they choose to. Uh, there are six more days during this 14, 14 day period that need to take place for them to uh, get off the watch list. Uh, so if all things remain the same going forward on September 1st, the county will be off the watch list. So at that time, schools that choose to in San Diego County can reopen physically. Um, Vista Unified School District, they open, I believe it's on September 8th. They have committed to doing six weeks of the virtual learning and then uh, come the week of October 19th or 20th, they will um, entertain whether they want to go back physically if, uh, in fact, the county gets off the state's watch list. Um, I did want to say that really the watch list at this time, as it states today, only really applies to schools. It does not apply to businesses. So we still have um, a number of businesses, as you all know, that are affected uh, by not being able to uh, operate indoors. And so the state, uh, I should say the county, is hoping to hear from the state uh, this week on news of uh, reopening procedures or uh, increased guidance from the state that they don't already have. But right now, as you know, we have gyms, we have fitness centers, we have barbershops, salons, uh, places of worship, uh, movie theaters, wineries, breweries alike that are not able to open indoors right now. And so hopefully uh, the county will get some good news from the state this week. And that's what they're hoping for. Um, the latest numbers are within the county. There are um, 37,000, almost 37,000 people who have tested positive for COVID. 36,727 is the exact number. Uh, unfortunately, there have been 660 deaths. 
And in Vista, we have had a total of 936 positive cases. And these were the numbers as of last night. Um, so that concludes the brief update. If anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them or answer them. House member Green. I'm just wondering, what does it take for us to be put back on the watch list? Like, I know we've been off for seven days. If the numbers come back one day, are we immediately put back and we got to reset for 14 days? And what does that number look like and how far away are we from hitting that number on a daily basis? So the numbers actually, the numbers actually look pretty good. Um, it's case rate. So greater than 100 uh, people testing positive out of 100,000 population over a three-day period. Right now, we're testing at 81.7 in the county, which is a, a very good rate. Um, the other one is hospital capacity. So if you approach 80% of hospital capacity, then you've triggered that uh, metric. And right now, the county's at 69%. Uh, and hospitalizations uh, is another one. ICU capacity. So right now, uh, ICUs have a capacity of 35%. When you get under 20%, it triggers that metric. And then ventilator capacity is another one. And right now, we have 52% 50 of ventilators uh, that are available. And when you get under 25, you trigger that metric. So there's this, uh, I think if you trigger three of the five or six different metrics, uh, that's what puts you back on the watch list over a three-day period. So they have to be triggered constantly three days in a row in yeah. order to put you back on. Okay, and it looks like we have a little cushion in all of those matrices for right now that we could really hit that 14-day target. So That's correct. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, with that, do I see anybody else that wanted to say anything? Nobody will move on to um, our Captain Justin White. He's going to provide the Vista Sheriff Station update. So, um, Captain White. And give me just a moment to bring up the uh, slideshow. All right, there we go, sorry. <laughs> All right, are we ready? We're ready. Okay, good evening, uh, Mayor Ritter and city council members. Thank you for giving me the time to present the 2020 law enforcement update this evening. Uh, I'll start with a quick look at some of the relevant stats for Vista. Uh, in Vista, we've had about 18, little over 18,000 calls for service this year. Uh, our crime rate is at 16.6, which I'll, I'll talk uh, talk about a little bit later. Um, as you know, we have about 93 sworn officers in Vista, and that equates to about 0.9 deputies per thousand residents here in Vista. Uh, regionally, that number is about 1.28 per thousand population, and the average nationwide is 2.8. The law enforcement expenditure capita for law enforcement here in Vista is about $215 per resident. Right now our crime rate is at 16.8. And as you can see, it's gone down over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, and I, I know it looks uh, statistically really good, but I would caution that likely this is a result of COVID-19 and some of the state and county orders that have been acted, enacted as a result of that. Uh, we do expect crime will, could possibly tick up as, as those restrictions are removed and people start going back to work and businesses are reopened. But having said that, over the last several years, Vista has seen a consistent decline in crime rates, as you can see by the chart. And uh, I wish the Sheriff's Department could take full credit for this, but um, I have to uh, admit that it, it's been a team effort between the Sheriff's Department and the City of Vista. Uh, the City Council and the, and the City staff have implemented several programs and made improvements throughout the city that have assisted with us targeting crime uh, throughout the city here. Uh, these improvements have assisted our patrol deputies and our crime prevention or crime uh, prevention people and our community oriented policing and problem solving unit in addressing crimes that impact residents of Vista. Uh, some of these programs 
uh, include the homeless strategic plan, which encompass, encompasses uh, the homeless task force and housing resources for the homeless. Our COPS team uh, works with city public works and other community entities uh, to assist those suffering from homelessness in uh, providing resources for them, such as getting them rides to DMV if they're looking to get an ID card or a driver's license and helping them to get into a shelter and or seek out counseling if it's something they want. Uh, we can also address some of the littering issues throughout the city. Deputies are able to, you know, when they find these trash heaps or trash that's been left along, you know, some of the encampments and those kind of things, they're able to, to call public works and, and get that cleaned up. So it's a great um, team effort in that, in that regard. We also work with ABC uh, and to combat some of the over-servicing that we have throughout the city and also serving minors throughout the city. And uh, that's been a great team effort that we've had there. Our cr uh, city's crime-free multi-housing and graffiti abatement has been instrumental uh, in reducing crime throughout the city. We also target tobacco use by minors. This includes vaping uh, through education. We do inspections and details targeting uh, different businesses or adults who are purchasing or, or furnishing minors with uh, tobacco. We also monitor the marijuana dispensaries throughout the city. And um, the current uh, crime rate is a, is a result of the corroboration between the city government and, and the sheriff's department working together to improve Vista's quality of life. And although our crime rate is low, we do have a few areas of concern, uh, domestic violence being one of those. You can see that 45% of the assaults here in Vista are a result of uh, domestic violence. Uh, what, things that we're doing to uh, combat this or to address the issue is we're regularly posting information and resources for victims on our social media page. The city has uh, added links to the city website on domestic violence, educational videos and resources. Uh, when deputies contact victims, they're providing information to our victims, be it you know shelter information, counseling resources, and information on their rights and, and legal resources that they may need. We're also looking into providing uh, some domestic violence classes through community groups such as Mano a Mano and the San Diego County Office of Education, their migrant education program. Uh, this would help educate those new to the United States on, uh, on educating them on our domestic violence laws and how they may differ from, from other countries. The other issue we, we have, we've been having in the city since April has been our vehicle thefts. Uh, as you can see by this, we've had a, a large spike uh, in our vehicle thefts since April. Uh, some of the top cars that are stolen are 1990s Hondas, uh, Civics and Accords. This makes up at least uh, 38 to 40% of the vehicles stolen this year. Within the last month, uh, we've been recovering a lot of these stolen vehicles in the uh, southern part of Vista, uh, which has helped us. We've actually made a, a, an arrest last week on a, or, or actually the person was arrested in Oceanside. And this person is someone that we believe has been involved in, in a numerous number of the um, auto thefts throughout Vista. We're also working on a public service announcement uh, to put on our uh, Twitter page so that we can help educate the public on things they can do to make their vehicles um, less likely to be targeted. Moving on to community engagement, we're currently developing our community outreach and trying to improve how we use social media, such as Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor to connect with the community here in Vista. We are involved in several community programs. Most of these are in partnership with the city of Vista. And these improve, uh, these programs include the Jupiter Junior Deputy Program, the Leadership Academy. Uh, we have deputy readings where deputies read to children in person or uh, virtually. And our Crime Prevention Unit conducts neighborhood watch meetings and works with the community groups such as the Vista Community Clinic and uh, South Vista Communities. One of the things that we're gonna be improving on on our side is from now on with our neighborhood watch meetings, we're gonna have deputies showing up to each of those meetings to make sure that the community can ask them questions and, and, and get decent feedback from how deputies are working in their neighborhoods and that kind of thing. 
We're also involved in regular meetings throughout the community groups, such as the Farm Workers Care Coalition. Uh, later this week, I'll be meeting with the NAACP to continue communications and discuss uh, concerns that are in the community. Uh, and, and so far, it's been going pretty well as far as that's concerned. In closing, it's been a, a challenging year with COVID-19 and the changes we have had to make as a result. Uh, but I feel in partnership with the city of Vista, uh, we have risen to that challenge and continue to provide quality law enforcement services here in Vista. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Does anybody have questions? I'll we'll start with um, Councilor Contreras. And then, and then Thank you so much, uh, Captain White. Um, and you know, we are we definitely have some stubborn issues, um, especially you know, looking at domestic violence. Um, but just because we are uh, we're seeing a lot of fires all over California, and Vista is not immune to that. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, if, hopefully, nothing happens. But if there's a situation where we do have fire. Uh, what would the role of the sheriff's department be uh, in, I, I don't know, helping evacuate or I just kind of wanted to, to see, you know, what, what that process would look like. Right. And uh, usually with fires, the way that, uh, that law enforcement will respond to that is the fire department is obviously in charge. It's a fire and they're the ones with, with the water and the personnel that knows how to use those big red trucks that they have. So <laughs> our job is to coordinate with them. And if they need, you know, roads shut down or a, res a residential area evacuated, we assist with that. So that's a lot of what we do is notifications, uh, crowd, you know, traffic control, making sure people get, get, we try to help get the message out by going from neighborhood to neighborhood and, and provide extra personnel that way. I'll try Thank you. Say also preserving the peace when the neighborhoods are cleared out to make sure that uh, nobody comes back into those neighborhoods that are vacant. Yes. We're obviously out there to help provide security for those areas that are affected by the fires and those kind of things, yes. And help evacuate people when they need it. A lot of times we have people that are stuck due to medical issues or age and, and we'll assist in getting them out of there. Thank you, I appreciate that. That's member Franklin. I just wanted to say thank you for your good work and your deputy's good work uh, in the uh, theft from auto and theft of auto in the south of Vista. We appreciate you catching some of the bad guys and driving those numbers down. That, that's definitely a challenge. Uh, it's It's been interesting that since we've started this COVID thing that we've had so many car thefts and uh, it is something that we're concentrating on because that affects, you know, the people in Vista because you need your car to, to get to work or get your kids to where they need to be, go to the doctor and everything. It's a it's a valuable piece of property that 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 gets taken away from people. So also have a lot of good feedback about our uh, speeding enforcement on Shadow Ridge Drive and other places uh, throughout the city. A lot of very appreciative residents that are very thankful uh, for our traffic enforcement deputies and their good work. Thanks, sir. Yep. We, we've seen that the, you know, whenever we do more traffic control in certain areas, especially it, it usually drives down the number of accidents we'll have in that area. So anytime we have a flare up of accidents, we try to do traffic control to that way people are, are driving safer and, and it keeps everybody, you know, following the speed limits as best they can. Councilmember Green. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. I actually got a copy of your slideshow, which is awesome. Um, I graduated from high school in 1996 here in Vista, at, <laughs> from Rancho Buena Vista High School. And right. the crime rate at that time was 40.25%. And I've lived in Vista continuously since then. So to see our crime rate down to 16.6% and just really being a town where people feel safe uh, and feel like they can be successful, they can drive, they can go to our parks at night and all of our parks for that matter, um, I think it's a really uh, great testament to the work that law enforcement does and also that council's done to provide yes, adequate infrastructure and lighting and just everything we've done. So thank you so much. Thank your team so much. And thank you for putting together this presentation. I'm going to share it everywhere so people can see where we've been and where we're at and where we plan to go. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
and if, if I didn't, if I didn't uh, say it enough in that presentation, I do really, since I've been here, I've been here for about six months and, and I know each of you already know, I, I lived here for about 13 years through the nineties and a little bit into the two thousands. And, and I've seen the improvements that this city, you know, the city council and, and, and the people who work here have done throughout the city. And, it, and to t that has a huge impact on, on crime and the way people feel about how they, they, about their city and where they're living and they take more pride in it and they're less likely to commit crime. So, uh, you know, I have to give credit to the, to, to the city council and the city for the work that they've done. So thank you for that. Thank you. De Deputy Mayor Rigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I just wanted to say thank you also, Captain, uh, for the work that you do and the deputies and the programs that you're working on throughout the community. I think they'll be very beneficial for our community. And uh, welcome to VISTA. You kind of transitioned in at the beginning of the whole COVID <laughs> shutdown thing. And so I wanted to say welcome to VISTA as our captain and welcome back to VISTA, to the community. Thank so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you also. I appreciate all of our sheriffs that are out there every day for their lives on their line on their on the line for all of us. So we appreciate you so much and stand behind you. So um, thank you. Thank you. Ma and with that, I don't see uh, any mayor. Other... Yes. Okay, we have one um, public comment. Oh, okay. For that. Okay. Um, so it's Justin. I apologize if I pronounced your last name wrong. Domestile. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, I'm unmuted. Oh, hi, everyone. Hi, Karina Contreras. You're awesome. All of you are great. Hi, I had a question. So during your presentation, you talked about expanded social media efforts. So I don't want to be that person, but it was really difficult to get onto the Zoom meeting because like, I found the old agendas first when I looked up the word Zoom on the uh, Vista um, uh, city website. So I found old agendas with old links. And so I was wondering if all of you, I don't know like what the police specifically do if they have public meetings, but if all forms of the city would consider having one Zoom link that's like reoccurring, so that way people can better access the meetings. Because I went through three, uh, three Zoom links before I finally found the right one. And I was like, oh crap, I'm like 20 minutes late to this meeting. Uh, not that I'm like an important person here, but I, I hope that y'all will consider doing something like that or expanding accessibility. Uh, for context, I teach seniors how to use the internet and how to engage. And during COVID, you know, a lot of senior citizens and older residents like to be engaged with um, their city councils, but they can't really do that if the links aren't immediately accessible for them. So I hope that that's something y'all will consider going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. And actually, we are using the same link now. So the one that you found and are using today, we're using for all of our city council meetings. So thanks for that input. And that's it for public comment. We'll go ahead and close the opportunity for public comment at this time. Okay, so seeing no other speakers on this, I want to thank Captain White for coming and giving us our, our update. And um, with that, we will, I guess, move on with our meeting to our consent calendar. Um, the recommendations on the following consent calendar will be enacted in one motion unless an item is removed from the calendar. Any member of the public may remove an item by using the raise hand feature or by pressing star nine now. Items removed from the consent calendar will be considered immediately following adoption of the calendar. And we have nine consent items this evening. So I would ask, would any of the um, city council members want to remove an item? And I'm looking, 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 and I don't see it. I see shaking heads. Okay, do we have any requests from the public? Oh, that was our city clerk. Any, any requests from the public on this? No request from the public, thank you. Okay, with that, then I will, um, then I would see none, I would, um, Close the public portion of the consent calendar and entertain a motion. Oh, Councilmember Franklin. Madam Mayor, I would make a motion to uh, adopt the consent uh, agenda. And uh, just one thing I want to point out, uh, we are uh, just to uh, provide for our business owners that are hurting and in need during the COVID crisis. Uh, we are moving our business license fees uh, all the way to, uh, Patrick, correct me, to uh, September yeah, so we're extending the deadline all the way to December, which December. We, penalties uh, don't occur until the new year. So we're giving businesses a little bit longer to pay those uh, business license fees and uh, appreciate them uh, holding on during this tough time. So with that, I would make a motion to adopt the consent agenda. Deputy Mayor. I wanted to say thank you for pointing that out. That was going to be my comment as well. And with that, I would second the motion. Okay, seeing no other comments, I will uh, say, Clerk, please conduct the roll call vote. 
All right, please state your vote when I call your name. Mayor Ritter? Yes. Deputy Mayor Rigby? Aye. Councilmember Franklin? Aye. Councilmember Green? Aye. Councilmember Contreras? Aye. The consent calendar passes unanimously. Okay, um, that moves us on to our public hearings. We have two public hearings this evening. Uh, public hearing number one, the first public hearing is to receive testimony regarding filing and processing fees for applications to expand the existing premises of a medical cannabis business in the city of Vista. So with that, um, the public hearing is now open. Assistant City Manager Ali Zimmerman will be providing the staff report. Um, and if any members of the public wish to speak on this item, they may indicate so um, by using the raise their hand feature or by pressing star nine now. Speakers will be called upon after the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Are you guys ready? So this item is a public hearing to establish a medical cannabis retail business expansion application fee. Next slide, Kathy. So as you know, just a little bit of history, Measure Z was approved by the voters of Vista in 2018 and authorizes up to 11 medical cannabis retail locations. Staff has been working to implement that since it was enacted. Um, and with each iteration, we're learning new things about the program and getting new requests from the approved businesses. One of the other measures related actions taken by council at the end of December was to add a provision for delivery. So we now have applications and processes to take care of all the things we knew about up to that time. Um, but a recent request by a Measure Z approved business, uh, a Measure Z approved retailer to expand their location into the vacant adjacent commercial suite resulted in a staff review of the time and procedures required to process this request. A new application process has been created and a review of the type of requests and staff time required to process said request determined that no existing fee was appropriate. So based on a review of the impacted staff positions and time spent, the current slide does depict the estimated staff time and proposed fee of $390 for the new medical cannabis retail business expansion application fee. Um, next slide, Kathy. And this completes my presentation with a staff recommendation to close the public hearing and establish a fee to process the application for medical business retail expansion in the amount of $390. Thank you, I'm available to answer any questions. Okay, so we'll go to, um, first we'll go to questions. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Rigby, do you have any questions for it? No questions, okay. How about Councilmember Franklin? Any questions? No. Councilmember Green? Um, no, I don't have any questions. I just have a statement, but go ahead. Okay, and then Councilmember Contreras, any questions? Okay, then, uh, then we'll go and we'll listen to the speaker. So um, City Clerk Valdez, do you have any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Mayor, we have two individuals that would like to speak. The first is Kelly McCormick. Go ahead, Kelly. Good evening, this is Kelly McCormick. I'm the parent of two teenagers and a public health educator. And I appreciate the staff recommendation to add a fee to the marijuana businesses expanding into a larger setup. Certainly all fees, especially those associated with marijuana businesses should truly reflect the staff costs. Speaking frankly, fees alone cannot cover the cost to youth and families. The parents I speak with are not in favor of the expansion of marijuana businesses. There's great concern about the advertisement, normalization, and even the glamorizing of pot use. I urge the city to consider the abundance of pot businesses already allowed by Measure Z when evaluating such applications. In reality, this expansion equates to bringing another pot business to town and should be counted as such. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next is Becky Rapp. Go ahead, Becky. Good evening. My name is Becky Rapp. I'm a parent and community member representing the parent community who are deeply concerned with the negative impacts of marijuana dispensaries in our community and especially on our youth. I'd like to share, um, thank the sheriff for his detailed presentation and for their efforts in monitoring marijuana businesses. I also thank you for discussing increasing retail business expansion fees. Increasing fees can be a crucial part in educating and protecting our community. It is concerning, however, that the city is considering to allow marijuana outlets to expand. As a parent, this idea of expanding marijuana outlets is upsetting. 
Are the dispensaries we already have not enough to service the city of Vista? Anyone can get pot delivered to their door any time of any day. It seems that when it comes to a marijuana retail store, more research and information should be gathered before granting them expansion. Expanding only allows for more inventory to be brought into our city, leading to more of an overabundance of pot. According to a recent SANDAG report showing 20 years of substance abuse monitoring data in California, drug use is up among teens another 5% from last year. We have learned that marijuana is the drug of choice for youth, and 57% of youth interviewed tested positive for marijuana. 91% of youth interviewed said marijuana is easy to obtain, and 58% of youth reported that marijuana is the first drug they tried. What can we learn from this? We do not need to expand pot shops in our city. We need to take time and educate our teens and parents during such uncertain times, and teens forced to stay home is home as parents we urge you to please consider limiting any marijuana expansion into our city thank you thank you and that's it for the public speakers so we'll close opportunity for public comment at this time okay so um comments from the council what's member green um, I just wanted to thank staff for their work on this and everything that they're, they're doing to implement the will of the voters here in Vista. I know that it's new uncharted territory and uh, we don't really know what's gonna be asked of us and kind of how to go about it. So I really do appreciate it. In regards to this fee, I actually was contacted by the business owner. It is a dispensary here in my district. And initially they were looking at what they thought were excessive fees. And just recently you might've seen the story that ran how we're charging $28,000 for the annual audit fee based off of staff time. And I assured the dispensaries in the area that that was based off of staff time. And I feel like this particular fee coming in at $391 um, as opposed to $10,000 or $20,000 does truly show that we're doing the research needed to make sure that we are only charging our business owners for what we need to charge them for. And I think that's a great thing that we're doing here in the city, approaching it with an unbiased approach. Um, they're obviously successful businesses that our residents are using. The tax revenue that's been generated has been excellent. And the focused impacts that we were concerned with, I really feel like they haven't been hitting Vista as hard as the skeptics um, were worried about. So um, from a council perspective and a council member's perspective, working with local businesses and just assuring them that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing on the city side, I, I wanted to take that opportunity to thank you and tell you that I appreciate you. Um, with that, I uh, would like to close the public hearing and move that we accept staff's recommendation to implement the fee as noted in the report. Senator Franklin. Just a clarification for the public who may not be aware of uh, what this item is exactly. Uh, this item does not uh, authorize new locations or increase the total number of marijuana dispensaries that are permitted under the Citizen Passed Initiative uh, Measure Z. Um, this simply provides for a marijuana business authorized under Measure Z uh, to expand in, within its existing uh, footprint to an adjacent uh, site, uh, but it does not allow them to expand beyond uh, the address of the initial site uh, that they were authorized at. Is, is that all that uh, correct? As I that understand is it? correct. Yes. Okay. It, um, if you were to move uh, away from your existing location, it would be considered a relocation, and that does trigger a much larger fee with much uh, more significant review. Well, I, I would agree with what Councilman Green said. Um, now, the uh, even those of us who didn't support Measure Z uh, understand that the people of Vista voted to adopt Measure Z, and we are doing our best uh, to implement it faithfully, uh, the will of voters, and to. Uh, deal with all the business owners in our city uh, who are uh, operating under the uh, auspices of the Vista Municipal Code uh, to treat them fairly uh, and reasonably and to assign costs that accurately reflect staff time. So with that, I would uh, second the motion. See no other speakers. Um, we have a motion and a second, so um, we will have a, a roll call vote. You. Mayor Ritter? Yes. Deputy Mayor Rigby? Yes. Councilmember Franklin? Aye. Councilmember Green? Aye. Councilmember Contreras? Aye. 
The item passes unanimously. Okay, uh, our next public hearing um, is to receive testimony regarding the proposed annexation, reorganization, and assignment of a pre-zoning uh, designation at 721 and 723 Pomosa Avenue. Public hearing is now open. Community Development Director John Conley will be providing the staff report. If any members of the public wish to speak on this item, they can indicate so by using the raise hand feature or by pressing star nine now. Speakers will be called upon after the presentations by staff and the applicant. And so with that, I will turn it over to, to um, not council member, <laughs> Community Development Director John Conley. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is an annexation and pre-zoning for sewer service, primarily on Plumosa Avenue. Kathy, next slide, please. The project site is located on the north side of Plumosa Avenue, shown here uh, in the uh, aerial photo. It's 0.64 acres. It consists of one legal parcel. It includes a duplex, which is addressed as 721 and 723 Plumosa. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the existing unit on the left side taken from the street and uh, the aerial photo on the right shows the existing location of the property and the surrounding land uses. It's all single family residential surrounding the site. It's an existing neighborhood. The city boundary is the blue line that's shown on the aerial photo. So you can see it runs along the left or south side of the property. And so this property is outside the city but directly adjacent to the city boundary. Next slide, please. The property is requesting annexation primarily for a septic system failure. The city uh, requires the county verify um, that the septic system has failed when we allow for connections to our system. However, um, when your property is directly contiguous to the city boundary, there's a city council policy that requires annexation into the city as a requirement of sewer service. And so this property, because it is contiguous to the boundary, is being required to annex in order to connect. Next slide. When we uh, look at annexations, uh, we review the general plan designation to make sure that the property is consistent with the general plan. In this case, it's in a medium low density designation, which is a single family designation, and it's consistent with that. Next slide. Uh, there's no zoning shown on the property in this slide because the city zoning doesn't apply yet. If the property were to annex into the city, we would apply a pre-zoning designation of R1, meaning when LAFCO approves it, the property would have an R1 designation, which allows single family uses consistent with the surrounding area. Next slide. Uh, in annexing to the city, this, the staff looks at a number of policies, whether or not the property is consistent with the general plan and the zoning, which it is. Uh, if the parcel is consistent with surrounding land uses, um, which it does, it also retains a legal non-conforming status with the duplex that's on the site, meaning that it was built before the zoning was established. The request is consistent with policies in our general plan that address annexations, uh, such as annexations of islands um, and low density parcels. Uh, however, when there is an annexation request submitted, um, the city reviews the fiscal impacts of the annexation. There's an analysis required consistent with the city council policy regarding annexations. That fiscal analysis evaluates the cost of city services for the parcel uh, in, a, in comparison to the amount of tax revenue that the parcel would generate. And so that analysis was also run. In addition to the annexation, um, there was a detachment from the Vista Fire Protection District, which would accompany the annexation. So it's officially referred to as a reorganization for LAFCO purposes. Next slide. Fiscal impact analysis that was prepared uh, was prepared by an outside consultant that uh, maintains the city's fiscal impact model, David Tassig and Associate. It's provided as part of the staff report. Uh, the impact analysis evaluates the cost of public services versus the tax revenue, as I mentioned. In this case, the analysis identified a recurring annual deficit from annexation of this property of $1,211. Uh, it identified recurring annual revenues in taxation of 1921 and recurring annual costs of 3,132. So therefore the deficit that exists must be covered for a 40 year pay, uh, term in accordance with uh, policy 300-1. And that equates to a deficit offset payment for a 40 year term of 27,992. That uh, number, um, 
evaluates the cost of the funds being paid now versus a 40 year period out. So that is the deficit offset payment that the applicant has been asked to pay along with the annexation request. Next slide. Uh, this action was reviewed by the Planning Commission as all annexation requests are on August 4th and they recommended unanimous approval with two commissioners absent. That was the land use action taken by the commission. They do not look at the fiscal impacts of the um, annexation that's left for the council. Next slide, please. And so with that, the staff recommendation is to adopt a resolution making application to LAFCO for the subject property, as well as an ordinance approving a zone change for pre-zoning to R1 for the same property, subject to the deficit offset payment that was identified. And that completes my staff presentation. I know that the applicant, uh, Mr. Krishnan Vijay, is also here and has some slides that he wants to present to the council as well. But I'm available for any questions, Mayor. Thank you. So would this be the time that, that he would, the applicant would present his slides? Or would that be under speakers? You normally we hear from the applicant right now. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, um, I'm a little nervous <laughs> to present in the audience. Um, Mayor Ritter, Deputy Mayor Rigby, Council Members Franklin, Council Member um, Green, and Council Member Contreras, thank you so much for your time. As all, already mentioned and awarded, I know as Deputy Mayor said, uh, the count, city staff have also been spectacular in um, working with me and helping me with collecting the information. We can go to slide number one. So this is a, a very simple case where I was interested in buying a property. It was last summer. The property was listed in the market. We made an offer on the property. We agreed to everything. There was something about the septic tank. We said, okay, just get the septic tank approval or uh, whatever the certification, certification of the septic tank. And the sellers went through, they went through a process for about four months and finally came and said, no, we're not able to do it. Then I did some due diligence. I estimated some costs and went in and said, okay, these are the costs that we estimate and these are the agencies that I need to talk to. And we uh, made an offer, we bought the property, I closed in December. Um, you can go to the next slide, next couple of slides. You have, some of you have seen this before. Um, so after we have bought it, there was, um, with the heavy rains, there was a lot of impact, um, had to empty the septic tank. These are all the repairs and the costs that I've already incurred um, in the property from the time that we occupied. I think this 12, December 4th was the date that we uh, closed. And by uh, the time that we um, are appearing for the planning commission, these are the amount I've spent. If you go to the next slide, it talks about the expenses that are going to come up. And these are all expenses that I had researched and I had present and I had put together. And there's a couple of other um, fees that are not mentioned here, or you know, um, something like a, a, an overage. I've not included that here. And a city of Vista trust fee, I believe that's supposed to be presented before we connect, and then it's refunded at the end of the construction. You can go to the next slide. In the interest of time and walking through, I'll be happy to go through it. So there was, um, when I met with some of you, you asked Krishnan, what did you, what, what type of credit did you get? And so going through the cost and everything, I got a seller credit of about $75,000. And um, with that, um, I thought, well, we are going to be in good shape, plus minus a little bit. And now if you look at overall, I'm still not halfway through and I'm already about 12K uh, um, um, under. Can you go to the next slide, please? And the financial model uh, was uh, done by uh, DTA, and I spoke to them as well. And first of all, it was a, it was a big shock when they said, Christian, you, you, you're in the zone of about 28,000 that you owe to, uh, to the city. Because this was not something that was mentioned to me. This was not something that I anticipated. And then when I probed a little bit into the financial model, I spent some time with them. And if it's modeled as a single family with about 3.2 um, 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 per household, the revenue is 1368, the expenses are 1567, the deficit is 199. 
And so the total 40-year payment would be about $4,600. And one of the other things that happened, and similarly I did with a duplex 2-2 two, two, and a duplex 2.5, 2.5, and, and, and a duplex 3-2, three, 3-2. Two, three, two. And as um, the, uh, Mr. John Conley mentioned, the model is basically at the duplex 3.2, 3-2, three, two, three, two, shows a deficit of 12.11 per year and 27.991 is what's due. One of the other things that the property suffers from or any property that's not a new development suffers from is the fact that if it's a new development, there's nothing there and therefore you the, the city gets property tax in lieu of the vehicle license fee of about $500. So if you apply that, the top two models are already giving a credit, a surplus to the city. And because it's an existing annexation, that's not even considered and therefore the top two scenarios above turn into a surplus, but that's, that credit is not even given to the to this financial model. Uh, can you go to the last slide, please? And so just as I mentioned, it is... A, 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 a very simple um, uh, goal of ours to buy Invista and based on, we gave every every effort for the seller to close everything. It would have been a normal close. However, after the seller spent a few months, they could not reach, um, get the um, septic tank approval nor uh, any any alternate plan. And then I'm pursuing this. And so my appeal to you is, um, the financial model, as you can see, is very broad and punitive. And as um, the, 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 the map showed, the property is abetting the city property. And it is uh, the, the property that's north of me and the property that's north of me is already on septic. The property that's across on Plumos on the south side is on septic. All the properties on the, if it's north, uh, on the west side are all on, 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 on uh, septic uh, sewer as well, right? So uh, all the properties are on me on Bona Vista sewer. And also, as, as I mentioned in the opening slide, Roger, one of our staff member, wrote a letter in 1994, Mr. Paul Farley, who was the owner at that time. And since then, the city and the county has urged the owners to change it. So I'm trying to um, write something that's been wrong. And I'm also not a developer, I'm an individual. So, um, and you know, as I mentioned, the city has not imposed this fee on anyone. So this is a complete surprise. It'll be shock for, for me. So my appeal to you is, please um, waive this fee. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so um, I'll go back to the council here and see if there's anybody that has any questions or statements or um, nobody has anything to say. Post number green. I'll break the ice. All right. Uh, I do want to make it clear that I have met with the property owner extensively. I've also done a lot of research um, on this particular issue. Um, is it fair to say that the deficit offset payment wasn't made aware to the property owner prior to the close of his transaction in December of 2019, Mr. Conley? Correct. Okay. So this is a charge that he didn't find out about until after close. Yes. All right. One thing I do want to say to the property owner is thank you. Um, thank you for um, being transparent. You didn't have to tell us that the seller gave you $75,000. And quite frankly, there was no way for us to find out. So you telling us that the seller gave you some money and to that tune, um, that you were given a good credit for it. However, I do see the numbers and it looks like they're going to be upwards of $100,000 just to connect your property to the local sewer, which that 20,000 extra dollars that you were made unaware of until after close is kind of that gap in funding that you're looking at. Um, so, you know, initially uh, I, I was uh, skeptical. I wanted to see what type of credit you had given. I also wanted to see if this would set a precedent. And in speaking with our director of planning, Mr. Conley, this uh, issue has only come before the city council one time in the last 20 years. Is that correct, Mr. Conley? That's correct. Okay, so the the chances of us setting a precedent of waiving fees for anything in particular uh, is not something that I'm too worried about. Um, I am one to admit when uh, you know you didn't get something quick enough from a city. I also want to be a property owner friendly city, and I feel like I've reached what I consider a fair solution. Um, one question that I did have for you, Mr. Conley, is when you gave your presentation, you said in pre zoning with LAFCO, you were having it annexed as an R one property is that correct 
Yes. Now, isn't this property considered R2 since it's a two to four unit property or is that still considered an R1 zoning? It's got an existing flex on the property that's considered legal non-conforming. So the county zoning only allows one single family unit as well, but because there's a legal non-conforming um, duplex on the property, the city recognizes that. It still comes in as an R1 zone because that's consistent with the general plan and the surrounding zoning. Okay, so we're accepting it as an R1, but we're making him char we're charging him for the, the R2 and the county doesn't look at it as an R2. We all look at it as an R1 or an SFR, right? Right. We would not want to zone it for multifamily because it wouldn't be consistent with any of the surrounding lots. He can enjoy the existing two units, but he can't add more. Exactly. So in knowing all that, I get all of that. And uh, I feel like, number one, it's a benefit for Mr. Vijay. Hopefully I'm saying that right, um, because he will be able to add additional uh, accessory dwelling units on that. If that's annexed into our city, it uh, helps us with our arena numbers and getting additional units. But one thing that I saw in his presentation, and I don't know, let me see which page this was on and maybe... If you want to put it up, page one, two, three, four, page five of Mr. Vijay's presentation had a couple financial models up there. And it had a financial model for a single family dwelling for a duplex that was two and two and for the other ones, which I felt the fees were pretty high for. In looking at all these fees, um, I personally uh, would recommend accepting staff's recommendation to annex the property, but making the deficit offset payment be in line with the lowest fee on that as a duplex. I believe that Mr. Vijay knew that he was purchasing a duplex. So to think that you were going to get the $45.99 fee would, uh, in my opinion, not be practical. But thinking you were only going to pay $82.28, and mind you, this is just a fee, an offset deficit. This has nothing to do with uh, city plan checks or staff time. This is just a fee, um, you know, as far as deficit offset. And I know how it's calculated, but looking at the square footage of this property, the footprint that it sits in, I really think it's more of a standard 2-2 duplex. And that fee of 82.2886, in my opinion, would be an acceptable fee. With charging that fee as opposed to the 27,992 fee, that would save you um gosh, I don't know, a little over uh, 20,000 bucks or just under $20,000. And I think that that would mean that the seller credit that was given to you was adequate to at least accomplish what you wanted. So um, with that, I, I, I would listen to what the rest of my council said. I don't necessarily want to offer a motion without speaking with them. But um, where I personally am at with it right now is that I would definitely approve the annexation, the presentation to LAFCO. But I would say the charge of 8228 is much more acceptable, in my opinion, than a charge of 27991 So as far as my council members go, that's where I stand. I'd love to hear from you guys personally. Thank you. Anybody out there? Any other customers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Vijay did not know about the um, additional fees until after the closing. Why, where, where was that ball dropped at? Mr. Vijay's, uh, the identification of the fiscal impact analysis wasn't brought until uh, after he had submitted an annexation application and we were well down the road. Uh, truthfully, the staff didn't identify it up front, um, frankly, because we have run these models for numerous other annexations for single family homes and we rarely, if ever, see a deficit. So we frankly didn't anticipate what threw us off here was the fact that there's a duplex on the property and that's really what generates the deficit. Okay. So that kind of was on our end of things. So, um, and then Mr. Vijay, you had yes, commented that you are not a developer. So, and this is a duplex. Are you living on the property or intend to live on the property in one of the halves of the duplex? Uh, I, I, I'm, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. No, I'm not living there now. I have a, a kid who is in high school right now in Torrey Pines High School, but it is a place that we plan to move into. Okay. Um, do you own other properties that you rent out? Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay. Thank you. Those are the only two questions I had. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Contreras. Um, 
In listening to the presentation, um, you know, I met with Mr. Vijay before. Uh, I, I am totally in support uh, in of the annexation. I'm still on the fence about uh, waiving any part of the fee. So I would like to hear a little bit more from my colleagues, but I do believe that the annexation um, is is good. So. Okay, I'm looking to see. And Councilmember Franklin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good. Um, the uh, the three two three two model is that that relates to the DUs per acre. That relates to the number of occupants in each household assumed in the model. Okay, and um, and how do we? Uh, assess the number of occupants that based on the number of bedrooms uh yeah each single family unit is assessed a 3.2 variable based on average across the county occupancy of single family homes so they just use an average for that number and that's 3.2 okay and do we have a history of assessing uh an average of two occupants for other uh condominium or duplex properties have no. we used the lower we typically use, use number anywhere. No, typically use the average of three point two or whatever the countywide average is at the time that the fiscal impact model is run. So here's my concern: um, What is the effect of making an exception for one property uh, the next time somebody wants to annex in a uh, hundred duplex units or uh, or build? Are we are you know, are we creating a precedent that we're going to have to honor or at least feel obliged to honor uh, for a future uh, development? So in terms of precedent setting, you know, the, the reason that this applicant is um, being required to annex in order to get sewer services, they're directly adjacent to the city boundary. We have very few situations where we have a failing septic system that requires an existing property to annex and is adjacent to the city boundary and so also gets the fiscal impact analysis. Normally, if you're a property that's not adjacent to the city boundary and you want to annex and you have a failing septic, we allow it through an agreement and you promise to annex at a later time. Um, we have a number of those out there, but this particular situation is forced into it because of dual policies, one requiring the annexation and one requiring the fiscal impact analysis. As far as precedent goes, uh, if we were going to do an analysis of a number of duplex that were new development, it's highly unlikely that those would generate a deficit because they'd have a much higher tax base and we'd have a much higher amount of fees that we would collect from those properties. So very rarely do new developments fail the fiscal impact. It's more a problem for existing properties. So in terms of precedent, no, at the staff level, we don't feel like it's a huge precedent only because we have very few of these situations where all of those factors converge. We have a failing septic. It's on a county property that's within Buena. It's directly adjacent to the city boundary and has the annex. Those situations are, are few and far between in my experience here. And uh, could you give me the, uh, the final assessment again on uh, do we trust the model? Why, why do we believe that a lower amount than what the model predicts is is fair to the city for uh, for future costs? Well, we trust the model. The model says, I mean, it's a conservative model. So it looks at the cost of services and it looks at the, you know, the, the tax revenue that this property is generating based on an assumption that there's 3.2 residents living in each of the two units. Uh, if the council believes that there's probably not going to be 3.2 residents living in each of the two units, then they have the ability under the policy to reduce or waive the, the payment. But that's at the council's discretion. From the staff perspective, we always take the most conservative approach to present you with financial information, and that's the approach that's taken here. And how many bedrooms in each of these two duplexes? Christian? Yeah, it, two and three, sir. Two in one and three in the other. It was one single family a long time ago and somebody put a kitchen and, and uh, went through the split somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So probably you're going to have uh, 
four occupants in one and three in the other it would be logical or I mean, it might be less than that, but that's a, that's a reasonable uh, number of people to occupy that number of space. If you have a husband and wife or two people in the master bedroom and you have, uh, you know, one, one person in each of the other bedrooms. So I don't know. I'm, you know, I, I, we're, we're facing a, another problem uh, in the city right now where, you know, sort of decisions that were made 50 years ago are, are impinging on uh, our finances now. And we're considering, uh, you know, uh, what we're going to do about that. So it's sort of a series of, of more decisions about uh, how we're going to conduct ourselves financially. So I, I want to hear from everybody else. Okay, so who have we not heard from? Also, Robert Green, yeah. I just had a question for you, Mr. Conley. Since we're going to charge this homeowner as a duplex, but the county won't recognize it as a duplex, we can't zone it as a duplex, he can't build more units like he's supposed to, based, like we're charging the guy $28,000 for something we're telling the county and we're accepting as zoned as a $4,600 fee. So for me, it kind of feels like even at 8,200, I felt like I was charging him a little much because I'm not annexing his property as a duplex. I'm not annexing it like that. So, and the other thing is, um, you know, study wise, I mean, we've always calculated duplexes at 3.2. Why would it, why would we be surprised with this figure if we've always calculated it this way? Um, that, that's my question because I feel like we probably calculated it as the way we were annexing it, which is why it wasn't an issue. And then when we realized, hey, it's really a duplex, we messed ourselves up. Our fault, not his fault, but please enlighten me on that. Yes, we, well, frankly, we haven't had a duplex go through this annexation process as an existing unit, not since I've been here in a long time. Majority of these are single family homes. And so, okay, and am I safe to say that if his property was seven, let's see, what's his address now? So he's 723. I don't even have it right in front of me here what his address is. But let's just hypothetically say he was two doors down and he wasn't landlocked to the city. He wouldn't, he pay zero dollars, right? And just a letter that says, hey, maybe someday I'll pay you. Isn't that how it works? He would be allowed to annex in a future date with a letter of intent that indicates that he'd be required to annex when the city boundary got close enough. But the current policy that's in place- I get it. Would still require that fiscal analysis at that time. When you actually hit his property at that time. But we would probably provide it to him right away and we'd probably annex it similar to the other properties around it and it would be something he'd be able to prep for as opposed to something sprung on him at the 11th hour. Most likely, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. That's Reverend Franklin. So did did our staff provide a lesser number at some point uh, or give reason to believe that the, the fees would be less uh, because of our oversight uh, in the fact that this is a duplex? There was no lesser number given, but we did indicate uh, at, at the initial stage of application that we didn't expect that there was going to be additional fees beyond the normal annexation fees. And Which so you thought, and, and, but you, you, you believed originally that you were annexing a single family property. I think the initial thought from the planning staff when the application came in was yes, that this was a single family property. We didn't get into the duplex um, component until we started the fiscal analysis. And uh, had we run the model as a single family, uh, the, the amount would have been how much? Around $4,500 if I remember. That, that, that's in the slide that uh, Ms. Valdez had up earlier. It's forty five ninety nine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm in, I'm inclined. Uh, I'm inclined. Uh, if uh, Councilman Green wanted to make a motion to, uh, in this one case, if we can, if we can do this, if we could just cut the number in half that we're asking for 28,000 how much 27991 i believe mm -hmm. so half of that would be 13995 
Councilman Green, would you offer a motion uh, to set the fee for this annexation, the uh, the deficit charge to thirteen nine ninety five? My only question on that, uh, Mr. Conley, is that does our fee structure have to match an existing financial model fee structure? That's why I offered the eighty two twenty eight. Is I felt like it was the in between number based off the current model. Um, I don't know. I'm asking you. No, um, the council is free to decide what they want to accept as the deficit offset payment per the policy. Okay, and you would be uncomfortable with the eighty-two twenty-eight. You're more comfortable with the thirteen, Councilman Franklin. Well, it is a duplex, and it probably is going to have, you know, reasonably uh, the three point two number is not unreasonable. Okay, um, you know, and I, I mean, I, I think there are some unusual things about this particular circumstance. Yeah, uh, maybe some some wrong um, uh, understandings going into it. Um, you know, I I, I would I would uh, want to hear what our colleagues think about that idea. But if that idea was amenable, I I think I'm I think I'm uh, mostly uh, you know all the way to agreeing to that kind of a concept. So. I, I I have a I, I have a question and then I, and I'll get you a council member. Um, it, so how how large is a lot? Is it is it like an acre lot? Is it a large lot? Point six four acres, Mayor. How many? Point six four. Point six four. So could he? So if we pass this, then he could put another ADU on that property. Is that correct? And that would be for going to our sewer service also. Yes, he would be permitted to build an ADU on the property that could connect to the sewer system. Could he put two ADUs on there? <laughs> um, state law may allow for that. I'd have to look into that. You could put one ADU. But for sure, I'm not sure about two. But you know you could put one on there, okay. Okay, Councilmember Contreras, I think I saw your hand up. Um, you know what, I am, I'm definitely receptive to lowering um, some of the fee. I just, just because it does seem like this is, you know, partially, I mean, unintentionally, uh, maybe a little bit of, you know, miscommunication and that we didn't know certain things. So I, I am uh, open to reducing the fee, uh, but it's a hard one to figure out how much to reduce it uh, just because there could potentially be a good amount of people living there. So I don't know. This is a tough one. So are you waving at me, Councilman Green? Oh, oh wait, let's go Deputy Mayor and then I'll go back to you, Councilman, okay? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the question was brought up about ADUs on the property <clears throat> and I don't know if Mr. VJ has any intention of doing ADUs now or in the future, um, but being a property owner and a landlord, you know, is something that definitely we have to consider in the future. So for each hookup, like if they do an accessory dwelling unit, how much would that be charged to, what are the fees for an ADU hooking into the system? There's no connection fee for an ADU per state law. It's only uh, service fees that are charged annually. Okay, so those would not be considered the same fees that we're asking here. No, he has to pay connection fees that are separate service fee that are about $6,000 per unit. So for the two units, he pays that. This is a deficit offset above that. Right, okay. Now, this is a hard one because I, I did meet with uh, Mr. VJ as well. I think all of us did. And I'm, I'm not particularly inclined in um, passing these costs off to the rest of the residents in the community. <clears throat> and if this was something that we knew was coming, it should have been part of his investigation into whether or not he wanted this property and he wanted to um, have it hooked up to the sewer system here. So um, I, I'm not inclined in, in doing that, but hearing the fact that the information for the amount of money that it was gonna cost was not information that he was given prior to the closing of the sale, that does give a little bit of heartburn uh, for us. 
and or for me. And <clears throat> I want to I want to do something on that, but waiving the fee entirely, I think, is something that we cannot do. I also don't want to set a precedent for people that, oh, we you we didn't know this because and, and then they want something else. So this is a, a real sticky wicket we have here with us. So um yeah, I'm I'm agreeable to a lesser amount. I'm just not sure how far less I want to go. I don't think Mr. VJ commented on splitting the difference and just cutting it in half. I probably could be agreeable to that. I see he's shaking his head no. Um, can I so, can I please speak, um, Madam Mayor? Okay, okay, sorry. That's okay with everybody. Is it okay if he speaks, everyone? Yeah, okay. Take sorry, it. I'm not I'm not aware of the protocol, so I'm, I really apologize. I mean, um, all of us, if. All of my neighbors there have talked to Jim, talked to Dave, Susan and Bruce, all of them. We are all single family. That that how it had come in is how it is right now. I'm not planning on putting an ADU anytime soon. I just want to make sure that I'm able to connect to the sewer. That's my that's my only requirement. The other thing is if you looked at looked at the cost that had come in, I had put some numbers through after talking with the city and after talking to LAFCO and Overages are not counted in at this point. And any surprise fees that come in are not counted. And I'm counting, you know, those may be something like $100, $200 because, you know, LAFCO may say you need a meets and bounds document or something. But 28 is a big shock. So all of you know, it's almost more than 50, nearly 50% of the whole hit. Please, I can, 28 is a big amount. I'm sorry that we are in this situation, but if I had known, perhaps I would have... Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. We, we would have dealt with it differently if I had known before. I'm, I'm, I'm. Please do the best you can. I, I the same. I, I also don't want it to be on the city. I've never believed in it. Um, I, I went through it, and as you can see in my slide number four, I'm paying for the two units, six thousand one hundred forty-three, six thousand one hundred forty-three. Even though it's going to be one line that's connecting into the city, because that's how it's. It, and Roger appraised me of that way before, right? Even though it's one line that's going to come from the lot to the to the to the main line in Plumosa, we're paying six thousand one hundred forty-three times two. Right, so I'm doing all of that. All that is is is, a, and I want to be fair to the city as well, right? But this 28 is is a huge shock. Please consider, please waive it. If not, I, I you know make it very small. I cannot, please, I cannot do a halfway. Madam Mayor, may I finish? Yes, Deputy Mayor. Um, so you might not have done yourself any favor with the comment i'm just going to put it right out there when you said uh not looking to do an adu anytime soon that oh. did not get past me oh. so and you are a landowner a property owner a landlord with property other places and that's a concern as well because if you're going to put an additional adu I, I know that we talked about the fees for the ADU and how the process is different, um, but your duplex, and it's been referenced a couple of times as, as just a single family home. It's not, it's a duplex. You can have two different families living in there and you can have um, you know, all these people. And I think uh, Councilman Franklin brought that up. So I think the best I would be willing to go is with Councilman Green's proposal and splitting, splitting the fee in half of what it's recommended. Um, because I think we have to take a little bit of responsibility in this not being disclosed completely prior to the closing. Um, and that probably would have made a difference in, in that deal. So um, if, if I, those were my comments. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I see anyone else? Councilor Franklin and then I think Councilor Green also. Then you have Franklin first? Thank you. Yeah. Franklin first. What... Uh... What would the deficit have been had this been a single family unit of 3.2 occupancy? 4599. Mm -hmm. So, well, just just real quick, Joe, I just trying to understand the model. Why does it so if there were two single family homes on this lot and it was 8900 or whatever, uh, why does this balloon so much just because it's a duplex? I mean, if, if literally he was to cut a, you know, uh, the uh, connecting wall out 
and separate these two properties, then it becomes, uh, why, why does our model do that? The financial model increases based on the number of occupants. So every resident has a cost to them. Right, so a single, family, a single family home is 3.2, a duplex is in his scenarios that he put forward, there's a four, there's a five, and there's a 6.4. There's you know two in each, two and a half in each, or 3.2 oh. in each. Oh, so I, I, I was looking at that slide where we were looking at the three, two, or the two and a half, or the two. But I'm sorry. So what does our what does our model assume for occupancy for for this particular unit that's being annexed? We assume 3.2 for each unit, so total of 6.4 people. So six point. But here's my question: If there were two single family homes, each with 3.2 people, but they were on separate pads, you, you follow me on that? Separate lots. Well, okay, yeah. Let's say he did a lot split, and let's say he cut the building in half, and he built it into two separate units. You follow? You follow? Mm -hmm. So then, if he was annexing two single-family homes, each at three point two occupancy, what would we be charging him right now? Most likely, the exact amount that we're asking him. And why, why is that? Councilman Green disagrees. Yeah, you would actually be charging him $9,199, which is two single family dwellings offset deficit payments of $45.99 per unit. And I think that's what you're asking, Council Member, is why is it, it $45.99 for a 3 2 house, but it's $27,000 for two 3 2 condos, basically? I don't think, I don't think Mr. Conley's in agreement. I want to know why. I would need to get the financial model um, person to answer that question. I, I honestly don't know. Mr. Johnson, do you know? No, I don't have the details on that. Just, But as Mr. Conley said, it's based on per person. And so... But, but, but follow me on this for a second. So if it was a single family home and it was 3.2 people occupants... Uh, our, our, is it that our stock fee is the $3,900, but then we would do a deficit study on that and that could raise it up substantially? Is that the, is that the case? Your stock, I'm not sure, I'm not following your stock fee. What do you mean by that? Okay, so the 3.2 fee. Again, we're going to go back to the scenario where there's a single family home. Yes. Not a duplex. 3.2 occupancy what will we be charging them? The forty-five ninety-nine per the slide that was up there. Kathy, can you put that other slide? But, yeah, but slide then, six. But then, because there's a wall connecting the two properties, it goes to twenty-eight thousand. And, and this is where I'm saying what Councilman Green is saying is the math doesn't add up because if it was two single-family homes, it would be nine ninety-two hundred dollars, right? Yeah. But instead, it's two duplexes or um, a duplex at twenty-eight thousand. So that's. <laughs> Where's that math coming from? And that's, I'm not sure why that calculation is made differently for a duplex of 3.2. Well, Councilman Green, I second your motion for the 8228 because I, I'm yeah. not hearing any information that's explaining to me if this was two single family homes on separate lots, it sounds like he'd be getting charged the 4599 twice. Yep. Uh, so 4599.84 times two is. Ninety-one, ninety-nine, sixty-eight. So, if your motion is to set the fee for this annexation for the deficit charge at ninety-one, ninety-nine, got sixty-eight, then that seems to me to be consistent because if this yeah. uh, property owner was annexing two properties, each single family, we're being told by staff right now that the fee would be four thousand five hundred ninety-nine eighty-four each. Yes. Yes. So, All right, I, I, and and I'm hearing no countervening logic from anybody. Uh, well, although there's still time to weigh in. Councilman, when you look at the model, 40% of the model is based on the property taxes that are assessed or that will be generated to the city. And the remainder amount is a variety of factors. About 25, 26% is based on sales tax on, on a per capita, meaning the 3.2 on what they're going to spend in the city and what comes back is, to the city. And I think that's where the difference is. Is the property tax on a duplex lower than a single family home? Isn't it just based on its assessed valuation? Yeah, and in this case, it's six hundred and fifty thousand, I believe. Well, I, I I hate to say this, but that still doesn't countervene the point I'm making, does it? 
I'm just I'm letting you know what the the basis of the the charges are for or the the cost differential and a majority of it is property tax but then it gets into on a per capita basis that 3.2 persons or that 6.4 how much they are going to provide to the city and that and that's part of the difference I, I guess I could understand that if we were talking about two single family homes it would be a higher tax base you'd be looking at 1.2 million dollars uh, of assessed value rather than six I mean, that Joe that does make sense when you think about that so now now we're back to the uh, cutting it in half number okay I'm done uh, madam mayor I'm muted I'll turn okay. green Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is my thing. For us to speculate on what the value of half a duplex on a third of a lot with a failing septic system would be worth, and for us to base our number off of that seems ludicrous, all right? I do not want to get too far into the woods. If this is a three-bedroom, two-bath, single-family house, and there's another three-bedroom, two-bath, single-family house, both on a third of an acre, and they both have five kids, and they all live in the house, we're charging them $9,100. $199.68 for those two properties to tie into the sewer. Now, if there are these little dinky properties with failed septic system, maybe they would only be worth three seventy-five dollars each. I mean, I'm not an appraiser. Um, I haven't done a valuation check on what a house that's got to tie into the sewer and replace it is, but what we're getting property tax wise is what the market fetched for the property. So us to say, Hey, what would it be if we split the lots and put two properties on it and all that stuff. If he splits these lots, he has to pay an additional 45 99 for his new lot and whatever new permit fees as well. So make sure you know that is that if he decides to split them on top of this 9,200 we're charging right now, he will pay another 45 99. So before we speak any more about it, I think it's time to make a motion, see if we can get a vote on it. I really feel like as far as a compromise for the city, we initially calculated it as single family. It's not a single family, it's a duplex. So the compromise would be 8228, but adding it as two single families, it'd be 9200. So in my opinion, I'm fair. I think that's great. I would move that we accept staff's recommendation to annex the property as presented with the total deficit offset cost to the homeowner totaling $9,199.68. Can I get a second? And I have a question. On the yearly sewer fees, does he pay one yearly sewer fee or does he pay two for one for each? For the duplex, one for each side. Does he pay two sewer fees every year, or does he pay just one sewer fee? He pays two sewer fees. And this gentleman also paid two connection fees for only one pipe going to his house. So if you want to get him for an extra six grand, know that we charged him an extra six grand for the one pipe coming in, even though it's the two residents. So I feel like we're getting, uh, you know, 15000 extra dollars than we would from a single family property with oh. this offset fee and that additional sewer charge with the recurring sewer fees. So anyway, my motion stands if I get a second. Great. If not, that's where I'm at. But he's putting he's putting two houses of stuff into the one pipe. <laughs> that makes any sense. Okay, not seeing a second. Where House Member Franklin? You know, I, I've got the uh, agenda item up here, but I don't seem to be able to find the presentation. What, what's the current uh, fee that we're asking for? Twenty-seven thousand nine ninety-one. Nine ninety-one. So if we divide that in half, that brings us back to the thirteen nine ninety-five fifty. Uh, Councilman Green, you want to make a new motion? My only question with that is, is Mr. Vijay has already said he can't afford half. So I don't know that it'd even be worth making the motion. With the money he was provided from the seller, he can. Don't annex into the city. Put yourself a seepage pit in your property. Run your duplex in the county and save some money. Because if you can't afford the, the fees at this point, that's where I'd be at. So, no, man, he said he couldn't afford it. So I don't even know if that motion would make any sense unless he changes his mind then. Mr. Vijay, uh, would you? What would your uh, uh, action be if we were to set the fee at thirteen nine ninety five? 
I don't know, sir. I came in with uh, with the hope that the whole thing will be waived because I was, you know, as, as I went through the whole motion and all the expenses that I presented. But if not, at least the two that uh, the, the any of the bottom two in the model, financial model. Um, okay. Thank uh, you, Please, sir. please. Thank you. Well, I, I did, there was no support for <clears throat> the uh, 9,000 numbers. So I, I would offer a motion to split the fee in half. Uh, and uh, Mr. VJ will have to decide what's in his financial best interest. But, uh, you know, our taxpayers that live in the city uh, are taxed to take care of this system. Uh, the reality is, and the reason I'm arriving at this higher number than the two single families is, is you know, that if this was two single family lots, the properties would each be worth substantially more and the property tax base would be higher. And our property tax does support our sewer system, as does our sewer fee. And that's, I'm finally under, got, I got all through it, Mr. Conley. <laughs> and, I, and I understand now why the duplex is more expensive because it doesn't bring the tax base along with it. That makes total sense. Uh, you know, we, we try and set these costs fairly to represent actual costs. They're huge, they're burdensome, but they represent the actual cost of what it takes, uh, you know, to carry the effluence away from our home. Somebody's got to do that. It's got to be done somehow. And someone has got to pay for it. And that someone is all of us that live in the city. And so if we allow people to annex in and access our system, but not pay the actual cost, that actual cost is to be absorbed by somebody. And that somebody is the people who elected us. So for that reason, uh, I think we are offering a major concession. And, and honestly, the only reason that I'm even willing to do that is because I'm, I'm seeing some daylight in staff saying there may have been some misunderstanding uh, and we feel that this is a righteous thing to do. For that, uh, I'd offer the motion at 13995. I would second, second that. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and two seconds. <laughs> Motion, motion by Councilman Frank and a second by Councilmember Rigby or Deputy Mayor Rigby. So, um, do we have any speakers on this? No, we do not have any speakers. I don't know if we ever asked that. Okay, so then with that, then I will. I think it's time. Joe, to speak. Joe has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Green. I didn't see you waving. No problem, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to thank my council so much and Councilmember Franklin for even coming up with the suggestion. Like I said, I didn't offer the motion because Mr. Vijay said he couldn't afford it. So I really appreciate you making the motion, Mr. Vijay, saving $13,995 in fees. I hope you do realize that by us council passing this, that's not, that's not, you don't normally get deals when you come to a city. So $13,995 in fees is bending over. So I appreciate you guys doing it and, uh, you know, helping Mr. Vijay out. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all very much, first of all, for giving time earlier and for this. I never wanted to freeload on the city. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, our city clerk will do a roll call vote, please. All right, thank you. Mayor Ritter? Yes. Deputy Mayor Rigby? Aye. Councilmember Franklin? Aye. Councilmember Green? Aye. Councilmember Contreras? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so next we have um, we have three discussion items this evening. The first one, D1, is our Paseo Santa Fe Gateway Arches. And Councilmember Green asked for this to be put on the agenda, so I'll ask him to introduce the item. If any members of the public wish to speak on this item, they may indicate so by using the raise hand feature or pressing star nine now. Speakers will be called upon after the presentation. So I'll turn that over to Councilmember Green. All right, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. So uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Madam Deputy Mayor, and my fellow, fellow council members. I bring this discussion item before you tonight, not as an item to divide, but rather an item to unify. Since we are now at the completion of this project after over 20 years of planning, I feel like it's our responsibility to look at these gateway signs one last time, take into consideration the opinions of our citizens and make the best decision for our city. I'm not asking by any means to do away with the Santa, Paseo Santa Fe corridor name. The thought and work of council's past to rebrand and design this corridor was a great thought and a huge improvement to our community. What I am asking is that we consider if the gateway arches encompassing this corridor are best designed as is, 
designed with the wording Vista prominent on top with Paseo Santa Fe below, or designed to read Welcome to Vista with Paseo Santa Fe below. We have all already allocated the funding for the construction of the Gateway Arch, so we're already building it. This discussion is solely to determine the final design and approve any costs associated with the decision to change if made tonight. I prepared a slideshow with a good amount of information as well as an actual sign design before us. These designs are easily changed and are currently on standby to to be constructed upon our decision. I ask that you approach this decision with an open mind and know that we're not discounting the work of past councils. We're simply reviewing it at the time of construction completion to ensure it is what's best for our current council, community, and citizens at this time. I appreciate and admire the work that each of you do, and I'm truly looking forward to this discussion. So with that, here is my slideshow. Uh, we're gonna start, uh, next slide please, Kathy. We're going to start just with signs around the county. I just wanted to put them up, and I definitely wanted to acknowledge that there are city signs and there are corridor signs around our county. I feel like the signs that were built for corridors were made because the corridors wanted the signs made, not the signs to make the corridors, which I kind of felt like is how Paseo Santa Fe was initially designed. Um, send to the next slide for me, please. Um, there's three options to choose from as far as our um, gateway arch signs go. Um, the Vista, um, prominent above the top with Paseo Santa Fe below. Welcome to Vista with Paseo Santa Fe below. And then the current sign design, which is Paseo Santa Fe with Vista below. You'll notice that the marquee on top of each sign just has the hummingbird and we have done away with the flower on top of that. Um, in 2016, prior to me being elected, Paseo Santa Fe was unveiled. And I remember the excitement as a resident that a new city sign was coming. And I actually was in Costa Rica and I watched it live on Facebook be unveiled. I was so excited. And uh, once it was unveiled, there was mixed reactions. Some people were super excited. Some people were super bummed. Um, there's a few articles that I referenced in my slideshow here that you guys probably clicked through when you were doing the research here. Um, more than 3,000 people almost immediately signed a petition asking for the wording to be changed because Vista wasn't on there anywhere. Um, and the initial arch back in 2016 cost $158,000. Um, just wanted to throw that number out there. There's a couple quotes that were in these newspapers articles that I just put up that I know you probably read before that were just people saying, hey, um, I'm a proud Vista resident. I was heartbroken. The sign didn't say Vista anywhere. Um, so after that, our city council, go to the next uh, slide for me, please, Kathy. Um, the sign was changed. You had an immediate meeting and there were probably a bunch of speakers and it was decided that we were going to add Vista just below. So you'll see the initial sign on the previous slide and then the new sign has Vista real small um, underneath. Now that passed at a 4-1 vote and the, the one vote that didn't pass was uh, Councilmember Franklin who uh, kind of slowed down and said whatever decision we make here this is hopefully going to last for 100 plus years and we want to leave it with a lasting memory that it was done in cooperation with the residents. And uh, it just was done with the Vista. We had some people who were semi-happy, some people weren't. As you know, eventually phases burn out and the outrage and the pitchforks go away. Um, but every resident I've spoken with over the last four years always has a comment about something about the sign, which is why in October we decided to make uh, little changes as well. Go to the next page here. So knowing that at the end of November, we're going to be building another sign. We're gonna do another unveiling. We're gonna stand uh, underneath this and say, hey, we're the council that completed this project and this is what we've done. Um, all I wanted to do is put it out there to Vistas one last time and get some input. And I feel like this is the last meeting, which it is, <laughs> that we would even have time to change the sign. And uh, you know, I'm a Vista guy. I've lived here my entire life. I love Vista and I would love to have a sign that says Vista, but without leading anybody on social media, I just posed the question. Tuesday, 825 at 530, we have a council meeting. On the agenda, we're discussing changing the Paseo Santa Fe sign to say Vista or Welcome to Vista and changing the hummingbird. Signs will match. If you live in Vista and have an opinion, comment or email your comment to public comments at City of Vista. Now, I know we got a lot of public comments. I 
read tons of them. I'm sure you read tons of them. Um, through social media, through my, my council Facebook page, which it actually tracks analytics. And I have 1,869 followers on that. I got 34 reactions, 51 comments, and 47 shares. Facebook said we reached 6,000 people and had 1,600 unique engagements. Now on my personal page, which the majority of my friends are Vistas, man. I've known them all for a really long time. Um, out of 3,700 friends and 4,000 plus followers, got 154 reactions, 224 comments, and 39 shares. Estimated 12,000 people reached 3,000 engagements. Across all those platforms, we had 231 individual comments or votes um, from actual Vistas. And there were 275 total comments and votes, but I know all those people and they weren't all Vistas. So I took the ones that I knew were residents um, that actually would have solid input. So the next slide for me, please, Kathy. Um, the results of the poll that I conducted was that 81% of people would like to see the sign change to Vista with Paseo Santa Fe below. 14% um, of people want to see Welcome to Vista over the arches with Paseo Santa Fe below. And 5% of people that I polled um, want to leave the arches the same with Paseo Santa Fe below. I do want to say that the community as a whole loves what we've done with that area and that they all really appreciate the upgrades that we've done. They're just really uh, looking for some, some, some city pride. And I think putting the Vista prominent and Paseo Santa Fe below really shows us, hey, we're a great city, and we have this amazing corridor that you can come visit that ties into our downtown. So we did uh, talk about this back in October, but we didn't have – um, different options to look at, nor did we have prices. So um, the next slide for me right here, if you could, Kathy, is the cost to change the Paseo Santa Fe gateway arches. Now, if we leave everything the same, it doesn't cost us anything. We build the sign, we leave at Paseo Santa Fe, we say, hey, this is what we budgeted for, this is what we're doing, and here you go, citizens, doesn't cost us a dime. So you have that option. Option two is that we change both arches to read Vista up top and Paseo Santa Fe below, just as the diagrams read. And there may be a color, I mean, I know the diagram actually, mine's in black and white, so you see the color diagram. Um, but that's the, the, the Vista Arch. And then the Welcome to Vista Arch, total cost would be $49,900. A good amount of these fees is also the traffic control, and we don't really know exactly what it would be, but we have tied it into these fees, and this is actually the total additional cost. Um, we've already approved the construction of this new arch sign and directed staff to allocate up to $356,000 for this gateway arch. Um, I want to go ahead and go to the next slide for me. So as far as conclusions from just doing a little research and getting a slideshow together, I felt like on our city council meeting on October 22nd, we were not presented with actual options or hard figures to make an informed decision on what a change to our sign would entail. I remember thinking it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to change the sign and that it was impractical financially to change the sign. But after looking at these numbers and seeing that it's only 35,000 bucks, when we have an annual budget of $73 million and we've allocated $356,000 to this project, it seems like something maybe, and that's my second conclusion, with $356,000 allocated towards this project, our $35,000 change may be able to fit into it. Um, once all everything's said and done, and we haven't seen the contingencies and uh, all the rest of the money's left over at the end, and we won't know till the end, but I really feel like this ask isn't that huge of an ask, nor is it a burden on our taxpayers. Uh, the third thing is the majority of Vistas would prefer our gateway arch signs change to read Vista, not only from my poll, but just from conversations. I've been attending a lot of events around Vista the last four years I've been elected. Anytime we talk about it, you know, they always would have rather had Vista. Nobody really thought we could make it say Vista. And I really feel like this is our opportunity if we want. The fact to change the sign to read Vista, it would be $35,500 more than we currently have approved. Uh, the other conclusion is the cost to change to read Welcome to Vista would be less than $49,900 more than we currently have approved. And my last conclusion is that based off of everything that we've probably all heard and everything we've all researched, more than anything, we should discuss changing the verbiage on the existing sign and new Paseo Santa Fe Gateway Arch sign to ensure that when the project is completed, the community knows we reviewed all facts along with four years of community conversations before the final decision was made. 
So um, that's my presentation. You can go to the next slide, which basically just says, what are your questions? But more than anything, I just want to hear from my council members. And if you say, hey, I don't want to change it at all. I love Paseo Santa Fe. What's the logic from that? Who have you spoken with? Where's the support? If you want to change it to Vista, why do you like that? If you want to change it to Welcome, why do you like that? I mean, as people who have had a lot of people vote for us, I'm sure that you've gathered a lot of input on this item, and I'd really like to hear where you're at with it before I make any type of motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to present. Okay, does anybody want to go first? Okay, Councilmember Contreras. Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Green, for bringing this up. Um, as you know, I, it, you know, the last time we reviewed this, it was a four to one vote, and I was the vote against it, simply because uh, I have heard um, probably more than I even uh, ever wanted to hear uh, the complaints about the sign. And, and I, um, I'm actually one of those complainers, to be honest with you, because <laughs> I really do believe that um, we have a lot of pride in our city. Uh, I uh, think that um, this council and previous councils have done a great job of rejuvenating the downtown. And, you know, at one point, um, it probably made more sense to think about rebranding, right, with Paseo Santa Fe. But uh, now we're in a position where we do have this rejuvenation um, that has gone really well where uh, we don't necessarily need to rebrand. We just have to uh, properly invest in the city of Vista. Um, and a small investment uh, of, you know, around $35,000 um, where we can proudly display a uh, Vista on our arches, I think is a small cost uh, with a huge return on investment simply because uh, people do not take pictures with the Paseo Santa Fe sign right now. So if we want to have this as a long-term marketing uh, strategy, uh, $35,000, uh, you know, less than $40,000 to have a huge return on investment for, you know, beyond uh, our lifetimes, uh, I think it's a really small investment uh, to make and it's the right thing to do. Uh, so I am fully supportive of uh, moving forward and having, uh, I think the Vista clearly won. Um, the Welcome to Vista didn't do as well as Vista. Um, but I think it is important for us to have the Paseo Santa Fe um, because we put so much uh, time and effort into creating uh, Paseo Santa Fe. Uh, so maybe just a little bit smaller on the bottom, Vista really big. I'm, you know, the, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I almost feel like it would look better without even the hummingbird. Cause now when I just look at the hummingbird, I just look at what else is not there. So maybe that will change in the future. Um, but it, it's just, yeah. Um, preferably I would say no hummingbird Vista Paseo Santa Fe on the bottom. Um, but I'll take Vista with Paseo Santa Fe on the bottom. So. Anybody else, or do you want me to go ahead and go? Okay, Councilor Franklin. I was just going to ask if we have any public comments. We do not have anyone that's requested to speak. Okay, did you have? Did you want to say something, or you, I, ha, I have some things to say, but I can wait. Madam Mayor, I'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm I'm the old one. <laughs> I've been with the Vista for 49 years. I can do just a little little history here for everybody. But um, so Santa Fe was planned. Actually, I remember talking to Glory McClellan about this, and that would be when I first on the council 22 years ago. She actually there actually was an adult store down on South Santa Fe, and she used to sit outside of it every day with her sign and protest um, at that time, and and it was full of crime and. Um, um, other things, <laughs> prostitution, but and through the years we've met with like the businesses downtown. They, they wanted they had community. We had community meetings. People came in throughout Vista. This was years ago. We had community meetings. We talked about the arches where we wanted them. We talked about the lawn, the, the street furniture. We talked about um, you know the fixtures that were there, what style that, that they wanted, all of those kind of things. And the the community wanted to change the image of the corridor. They 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 weren't thinking that that was Vista. At that point, you, you wouldn't want, would you want to put Vista there? You wouldn't want to put, this is Vista. So they, they wanted to change the corridor and the perception that their business was on that corridor. And that's what they were looking at changing. And so 
Um, actually, that goal continued through several councils, and I can tell, I mean, through Gloria, my first council, Dick Cook, Ed Estes, um, Ted Cole, went through Frank Lopez, who actually owned Casa Linda down there, um, Bob Campbell, Paul Campo, Mayor Morris Vance, I'm sure I forgot a few of these people I, if I start li you know, listing them all, but it's been through several councils and always the goal was there to go to that corridor. They wanted to make that corridor better. That was their goal, all of their goal all that time, but we never had the money. We could never get the money to do it. And, th and that was what the problem was. So, um, but it was to change the perception. So, um, but now I, I worry that you're doing this to end this. And I'm not going to, if all of you want to do that, I, it's fine. I understand. I, I'm old. I've been there too many years. It's time maybe for new people. But you, you know, you reference the last four years. I'm talking the last 22 years. So and it's been a plan for that long. It wasn't something that just we don't plan things and then they one year and then the next year we do it. it big projects in the city of Vista take the Corcorian Center. All those things took a long time to build. And the ideas today that everybody has are maybe not the same as what they were years ago. So, but but we're going to bookend the corridor, this at one end, this at the other end, but however you want to do it. It kind of leaves out the downtown and the Sinopolis Center. If you want to say, is this is this what you say? This is welcome to Vista and this corridor is Vista? There's more to Vista than that street. I would say if you're going to say Vista, you want to say it on Vista Village Drive, which is where we talked about it years ago. That was where they said, where you come into Vista, then you say Vista. This is where this, you know, welcome to Vista or Vista. That was, that was totally a corridor change. Now, you know, if you guys want to do that, uh, it's fine. It wasn't for selfies. It wasn't for people to get their picture taken by the arch. It was for the businesses and the change in the corridor to the perception for the businesses. And I drove down there yesterday, and a lot of the businesses have changed the facades. They're all upgrading. It, it looks wonderful. And, the you know, the whole the whole improvements are just, I'm so proud of what's going on there. I was proud of the Kokorian Center, or the Sinopolis Center, when they built that. I'm proud of this. It's a it's a thing we all can be proud of, you know, in this stuff. So I, I get it, and I get that there's a lot of people that weren't happy with that. A lot of those people just moved to Vista or haven't lived here as long and weren't a part of the planning process because it was planned for so long. Things like that corridor don't happen overnight. They happen over a lot of years. So um, anyway, so, but, you know, I just say we all be proud about it, and if that's what you all decide to do, I'm not going to stand against it. I, I, I will support you and it will be Vista. No matter what it is, I'm proud of Vista and what's going on in Vista. And so um, I, uh, that's all my two cents. Okay, Councilor Contreras. <laughs> Mayor Ritter, I just want to say that us having this conversation about changing it to Vista is only because it's a testament to the long way that we've come um, under your leadership and the vision um, that you have brought forth to the city of Vista and all the other councils before. Um, yeah. And so that's the only reason why now, you know, we're like, it's a no brainer. We should put Vista because people are so proud of our city. Um, so I just want to say it's a good thing that we're having this discussion because we have elevated our city to a level that people did not think was possible. And yeah, I'm 32. So, you know, I wasn't a part of any of these discussions. I didn't even realize uh, really what you all did until 2017, right? <laughs> when I started yeah. showing up to council. You were even born back then. <laughs> <laughs> John so, was. so again, <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> again, I just want to say this is, we're having this conversation about, you know, changing it to Vista because of the incredible amount of work that you and other councils have put into um, making Vista a, a, just a better place every day, trying to improve the quality of life. And now people, they want to show off their civic pride and they want to be able to take a sign, a picture with the sign um, and just say, I'm in Vista, you know? And so um, I know, I 100% can guarantee you that as soon as, if, if the council, it's the will of the council um, to change the sign to say Vista, um, as soon as it's, it's unveiled, our Instagram stream is just going to be Vista, Vista, Vista sign everywhere. It's going to be just in time uh, for our businesses um, to really, you know, be able to use that as a marketing strategy too. Like, hey, look at it, it's Vista. We're proud. We have rejuvenated this uh, part of our community, and we want to show it off to everybody. So I just want to say what we're talking about right now 
again, it really is a testament um, to the incredible work uh, that has been done uh, to improve the image of Vista. Um, so I just wanted to leave it there because I am really proud of, of everything that, that everybody has done. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate my co the co comments from my colleagues. Um, I just have a couple of comments and I appreciate, Mayor, what you said about um, the history of this. And I don't want that to get lost on anybody. Uh, we had a community committee put together. We had several community meetings uh, to talk about this and to work on this over a period of time. And it was through those community meetings and the votes of the people involved in, in all of that, that we came to what was brought before us. And I don't wanna discount all the people who worked on that, who were on that committee, all of those citizens who came out in those meetings and voiced their opinions and had the discourse and what they wanted and what they saw as their vision for this. And that's what was brought to us. And when we voted on the allocation of the funding for the first sign to go up, um, I was on the council for that. The previous vote for the sign, the design of it, et cetera, that was the previous council as the mayor had, had talked about. Um, having gone through all of that history with the community members, the residents, the businesses, et cetera. And at the time I brought it up, it was in our budget. We're going to allocate the funding for this. And there was nobody in the room. There was nobody in the chambers talking about it. It was buried in the budget. And I did make a comment that perhaps we would want to you know, postpone it and have a discussion on it because it had been a while. But some of the people who were on that committee did contact and said, you know, hey, we put a lot of time and energy in this, the businesses, the residents, and this is what our vision is. And we would really appreciate it if you would implement the vision that we worked hard to come up with and we look for this in the future for our city. So we went ahead and said, okay, great. We allocated the funding, the arch went up. And then that's when we heard from a lot of people who didn't, didn't like the arch. And I'm sad that those people who came out and didn't like the arch were not participating in the process prior to in getting us to the arch where where we were at that point. And so we had all this discussion. And as you know, we had to bring the arch down. We put Vista under it. Um, I'm disappointed to see, you know, Anna's hummingbird is the city bird. Uh, the California lilac, which is native to this area in Vista, is the city official flower. And I'm disappointed to see that you would take the flower off of it. And I'm disappointed to hear continuously what people think of the flower in the silhouette. Um, I wish there was another way that we could present the flower. And I'm disappointed that Facebook emojis have taken over the psyche of everybody, that that's all they think about, because there's more to it than that. And, and I, I'm disappointed that we acquiesce to the mindset of Facebook emojis instead of looking at the heritage of what is Vista. So that disappoints me that we would we would lose that instead of defend it and educate people. That's a hummingbird, that's a lilac. Um, you heard me say that the last time we had the discussion on it as well. Um, and when we talk about Vista, I have said this before, this is nothing new to anybody, but I think if we're gonna have a Vista sign, it should be in a gateway location. It should be coming into the city. And some of the pictures that, that Councilman Green showed had cities, you know, Carlsbad, Encinitas, El Cajon. And, and those signs are as you're entering those cities from one direction or another. The neighborhood cities, Kensington, North Park, whatever the other ones were, those are the signs going into those particular neighborhoods and identifying those neighborhoods. And I think when you put Vista, I would love to see Vista in a gateway entry to our city, uh, not just in a, a neighborhood area. And as I have said before, if I would love to see all of our neighborhoods, our, our particular neighborhoods that we identify have their own signs in one form or fashion or another. And they should all say that they are a community of Vista like Shadow Ridge signs do. I think they say Shadow Ridge, a Vista community. And I really like that because you identify your neighborhood, but you also keep it in the context of the city as a whole and that we are one people as Vistans. So I, I'm not in favor of Vista on top. 
because I think it's the wrong location for that. I agree with the mayor mayor's um, point on that. Um, so I, I wouldn't be in favor of, of doing that. Um, but I also am not in favor of changing the sign, you know, ex expending any amount of money on changing the existing sign that we have already changed once before. Because a lot of time and energy and thought went into doing that. And then we redid it at the behest uh, of, of the community. And we did what the community asked us at that time. And now, a couple of years later, we're being asked to do it again. What happens in a couple of years when people want us to change it again for another whim? I'm not really willing to keep doing this. Um, I also have a concern about the finances at this point in time. Earlier tonight, we had the conversation about deferring business license fees because of the COVID, because so many businesses are, are closed and have been closed. A lot of those businesses um, have laid off their employees. We here at City Hall had to lay off employees. Um, so I really question the timing of this and spending, even though it's been mentioned $35,000 out of X amount of money is doable. Is it fiscally responsible to the community in a time like this to spend money to change out a sign that we've already changed out? So um, for, for that and a few other reasons, I'm going to be a no on changing the sign on this one, but I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate Councilman Green bringing this back um, and, and allowing the conversation, but it's, it's going to be a, a no from me on this one for different reasons. Council Member Contreras. Um, I, I really don't buy the argument that this is fiscally irresponsible at $35,000. Um, so, and if anything, it would be fiscally irresponsible to put signs all over the place in Vista that's 18 square miles. You know, when we're looking at, uh, other cities that have, uh, you know, their name, um, we're, they don't put that like at the freeway entrance, <laughs> you know, these cities are putting it where it's walkable, uh, because it is a big financial expenditure, right? So you want to get it right. This is a marketing strategy. Um, and again, $35,000 for an overwhelming amount of Vistans that have commented that they can't believe it ever said Paseo Santa Fe to begin with, which I've heard the history. I understand it. Um, however, we are in a different place right now. Um, we're in a place again where we have a lot of Vista pride and I think it's time to show it off. I would never, uh, want to just create signs just to show Vista um, but we have two signs. I was not in favor of putting a second sign because I thought the $350,000 to allocate for a second sign, that was fiscally irresponsible. Um, but $35,000 to fix both signs is not that expensive. I mean, we're talking about, I don't even know what percentage that is. Um, we still have uh, quite a significant reserve because council was so prudent that we had an emergency deficit reserve to use before we hit our reserves. So we're, and we're getting all this money in Canada's with sales tax. So really to discuss, uh, to make a point that this is a fiscally irresponsible thing to do, I just don't buy that argument. Um, but, uh, I mean, how can we be so deaf to what people in Vista want? Um, it's just not, it's not a good luck for our city um, to continuously, uh, you know, kind of just plug our ears when we have so many people telling us for so many years that they really would like to show off their Vista pride in a different way. And if we were to keep keep Paseo Santa Fe, I mean, we're creating a make-believe place. I'm, ju I'm just going to be honest with you. It's a make-believe place. And if we were going to continue in that route, then we need to tie it into the city better. You know, we can't just, you can't just be driving, then you hit Paseo Santa Fe. Like, you don't even know where you're at. Uh, I don't think it's geo-tagged anywhere. Um, none of our, you know, the businesses, uh, owners, and, and uh, people that I talk to, they're not like... You know, they don't tell their customers, hey, head on over to, you know, we're between the two Paseo Santa Fe arches. It's like people, this is our downtown. If anything, perhaps welcome to downtown Vista, which is a lot more letters, which would probably be more 
than $35,000. Like I could see an argument where that makes sense. Um, but to just ignore all the comments from so many Vistans, um, I just don't think that's right. And again, this is a testament to all the hard work that all the councils uh, before this, including this council and our fearless leader here, Mayor Ritter, um, you know, it's a testament to the incredible uh, rejuvenation that we've had in our community. So I just, it's such a small sum of money uh, to really fix something um, that, and we, we've talked about it as fixing because that's that's the real term. Like people want this to be fixed to uh, be able to show off their Vista pride. So I could go on forever, but again, I'm happy to be having this conversation and uh, you know what, I'm just going to offer a motion um, at this point um, to uh, move forward uh, with uh, changing both signs on the gateway arches uh, to Vista um, with having the Paseo Santa Fe on the bottom, um, the design uh, that Council Member uh, Green put forward. So I'm just going to put that out there. And Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt. Mayor, would you have a couple of um, public comments now if you wanted to take that before continuing the conversation? Okay, I'll take those and then and then I have um, Councilor Green and um, Deputy Mayor raise their hands. So you guys ask the comments, okay? Okay, um, first speaker will be Amanda May Fitzgerald. Go ahead, Amanda. Hello, thank you for listening. Um, I really appreciate you guys giving me this time. Uh, I have to say that I agree with Council Men Member Green and Council Member Contreras. Um, when it when the sign first went up, um, I heard a lot of comment um, from City of Vista members that didn't quite understand what it was for or why it was um, called Paseo Santa Fe. I get that that is Santa Fe, um, but. I think that there are a lot of people that that causes confusion for. I also get Mayor Ritter um, putting in all of the years of effort towards making that corridor look better and it looks amazing. There's no doubt about that. I just think that it not being called Vista or that Vista not being there is confusing. And if you're talking about branding as a business owner, you want everything in your brand to be the same and to be uh, recognizable. And I think that putting Vista in that corridor makes sense. If we wanted it in a different corridor, um, it would have made more sense to put it in a different corridor, but it is the standout corridor for our city. It has become that. Um, and as a public arts commissioner, on the hummingbird note, I know that we're, we're gonna be putting another hummingbird sculpture in that corridor. And I think that the hummingbird makes sense. And I, I love seeing the hummingbird um, as our Vista symbol. So I, I really hope that you guys will consider changing it to, um, to say Vista with uh, Paseo Santa Fe underneath in smaller letters. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Cliff Kaiser. Go ahead, Cliff. Uh, greetings, Council. Uh, just a couple of comments. When the sign went up uh, way back when, uh, 2016 maybe or something like that, um, the renderings that were provided to the public up until very near the council meeting that it was approved were not what was up there. So the statement that the public had plenty of opportunity to be to get involved in the planning and the discussion is not entirely correct because what went before the council was different than what they had seen prior to that. Uh, the other comment I have is with regards to the, the bird and the, uh, the lilac. Um, generally, if a sign cannot be read or interpreted without an explanation, then it's not a good sign. So that's, that's uh, reason enough to reconsider uh, the bird and the lilac. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, completes public comments. We'll go ahead and close opportunity for public comment at this time. Okay. Councilman Franklin, I have um, I had Joe Green, our Council Member Green, and, and Deputy Mayor first, and then I'll call on you. 
So we actually hadn't heard from Councilmember Franklin yet, so I'm fine to let him take my spot. That's fine. Okay, Councilmember Franklin, and then Deputy Mayor. You know, I uh, I have sympathies to both sides of this argument. Um, I do understand that you know nearly 20 years of planning went into uh, creating Paseo Santa Fe. Um, I have to agree with uh, Councilwoman Contreras. I never understood the the double arches. Um, that never really made sense to me. Um, I've never seen that done elsewhere. And I understand the intent to frame uh, the corridor, but two of the exact same arch never really appealed to me. Um, I'm going to throw you a curveball as I like to do sometimes, we've already paid for an arch. What if we were to put it over Main Street at Michigan from curbside to our little, we have a little tiny, uh, you know, we have a fountain on the corner there at, at Michigan and Maine. What if we were to put a, a Vista sign there? What if we were to move the sign we've already paid for? We're not buying a new sign. We've already paid for one, hadn't been built yet. I can see uh, our city manager is really loving this idea. Uh, I'm sure there's 10 reasons why this does not work, but I'm sure we could find our way around all of them. Uh, you know, the uh, the archway signs, the, I, I agree. There's, they're, they're usually in a walkable neighborhood, and they're usually in a place where you want to get out of your car and be on foot, uh, you know, and, and I... You know, the selfie didn't exist 20 years ago. It does now. It is reality now. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it was Patrick and John Connolly were uh, in the city council conference room. And I got to admit the very first thing when he laid the drawing down uh, of the Paseo archway, the very first thing out of my mouth was, it doesn't say Vista. I was... A little taken aback, and it was the, that was my first, uh, you know, glimpse of the sign. Well before it was constructed, was to see the the sketch of it, and I was I was kind of taken aback, and I I had fully expected this beautiful arch to say Vista, um, but but at the same time, I do want to honor uh, the decisions that were made before, uh, and the council and the citizens who planned, uh, and all the work we did to really change the. Uh, the the, uh, the nature and, and really make people proud to want to go to the Santa Fe corridor. Uh, so I'm going to throw this wild harebrained idea out. I don't. When are when are we supposed to begin construction on the second arch, uh, or have they already uh, begun the metal work? So Councilman Franklin, uh, the arch itself has already been built. The second one. Um, yeah, and some of the, the lettering's already been completed, but obviously it hasn't been fabricated together. Well, your comment on having an arch on Main Street, the, yeah. the problem with that is the arch has already been built, and it is a lot larger than the, right. the footprint from curbside to the fountain, we'll say. Yeah. But I did want to comment on South Santa Fe, though. The goal was to make it a walkable community. And, you know, the council can decide what you want to do with the sign. But in terms of pedestrian-oriented, um, it went from four lanes to two lanes. So it had a road diet. The sidewalks are widened. So when it's done, the sidewalks are widened all the way down. And that was the goal is that it would be more of a pedestrian uh, destination to be able to shop and uh, eat and dine and live, frankly. But in, in answering your question, the arch is done. The span of the arch is a lot larger than uh, what would go from Main Street to the, um, to the fountain area. Yeah, I thought that might be the case. Well, given the fact that it's already constructed, that uh, kind of kills that idea. Uh, but, you know, the idea I was having before that, which is probably equally bad, was what if one of the signs said Vista and one of them said Paseo Santa Fe? Yeah. And, yeah, I didn't think anybody would like that idea. I just thought I'd throw <laughs> it out there. Okay. It would be, a, it would be a, everybody gets uh, a little something what they want. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Who was first? Was it was the deputy mayor first, and then Councilmember Green? I can't remember. 
I think it was Council Member Green. Okay, Council Member Green. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to comment on a few things. Number one, I never did get to just reiterate my thanks to you, Madam Mayor. This truly is your town, and uh, I know it, I feel it. Uh, everything that you have said and that you have done for this town over these years is huge. And 22 years ago in 1998, our crime rate was 41%, and you were absolutely <laughs> correct. I would have not wanted to put a Vista sign anywhere near Paseo Santa Fe. Um, you know, the work that you've done down there rejuvenating that area and making it an area that my family and I can walk down at night and want to walk down at night. I mean, the fact we are having this conversation, as Karina said, is a huge testament to the work that you've done. So I want to make sure the work of the past is not being discounted. We're not getting rid of Paseo Santa Fe. I would even say change the name of the street in that area to Paseo Santa Fe instead of just Santa Fe, branded even more street name wise. But as far as community pride and Vista goes, I beg to differ. This is a gateway to our city. If you're going to City Hall, you're going to pass this sign. If you're going to Belching Beaver or Krikorian, you're pretty much going to see this sign. Vista Village Drive and Civic Center Drive are two huge arterial streets in our community. People from Temecula use our city as a cut through. We talk about why our traffic's so bad. It's because people are always driving through those streets. So I believe we have tons of traffic on the street, and it is a perfect Perfect highlight to this corridor and making it say Vista. You're absolutely correct. I love Vista. You guys know more than anything. I got Vista hats, skateboards, shirts, you name it. Every time I go on vacation, I take a picture with Vista. You know how many selfies or pictures I've taken with the Paseo sign? None. And I know it's not about selfies, but I'll tell you what. Vistans are going to come down to Vista to take a picture with that sign. Then they're going to spend money at Sonic. Then they're going to walk to Belching Beaver. They're going to go to Bear Roots Brewery. They're going to go to Milk Organics. They're going to go to all of our amazing restaurants, Miko Sushi, Town Hall. I mean, you name it. We've provided this atmosphere for people that they want to come to. And I love, nobody else has bookend marquees. But guess what? <laughs> Vista can have it because this is our corridor and we're Vista and we're different. So I really feel like this is a gateway. This is something that's awesome. When's the last time you could spend $35,000 in marketing and get a 10, 20, 30 year return on investment? We spent a ton of money on Vistas Open and helping our businesses. This sign is going to attract all 100,000 Vistans to that area because they're all going to want to stand in front of a sign in a city that they live and show their families, look, I live in Vista. Oh, and this is our cool corridor, you know? So for me, $35,000 is 0. 0.0004 percent of our budget 0. 0.0004 i am not a fiscally irresponsible person i've owned my own business for 22 years i'm the sole income of my wife and four kids and when i look at all the money we spend as a city on the things we spend it on this line item is something i am more happy than anything to spend money on so with a very huge enthusiastic i'll be seconding Karina Contreras' motion to change the sign to read Vista up top and Paseo Santa Fe below. Thank you for your time. Deputy Mayor, your turn. <laughs> I have no other comments, Mayor. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Seeing no other comments, we have a motion and a second. I will guess I... Okay. Well, Mayor, if I could, and and what you're saying is, uh, Councilman Green the, or uh, Councilman Contreras, the picture references Vista, Paseo Santa Fe underneath, with the hummingbird still in the um, sign. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so then I will ask for um, a roll call vote, please. Okay, thank you, Mayor Ritter. Yes. Deputy Mayor Rigby. No. Councilmember Franklin? Aye. Councilmember Green? Aye. Councilmember Contreras? Aye. I'm so happy I could cry right now. Thank you. <laughs> that motion passes with Rigby um, voting no. Thank you. Save it for your selfie. <laughs> okay, next. Let's see. Where are we? Oh, D2. Okay, here we go. Um, the next um, discussion item is a proposed zone change at the southwest corner of Eucalyptus Avenue and Civic Center Drive. Public hearing is now open. Community Development Director John Conley will be providing the staff report. And if any members of the public wish to speak on this item, 
They may indicate so by using the raise hand feature or pressing star nine now. Speakers will be called upon after the presentations by staff and the applicant. So with that I turned over to um, our community development director, Hunley. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is a preliminary review of a request for a zone change, a caddy corner from the Civic Center at the corner of Eucalyptus and Civic Center Drive. Kathy, if you could forward to the next slide. Uh, an applicant has submitted a preliminary request to change the zoning designation on two parcels that are part of a larger development site of three parcels located at the southwest corner of Civic Center and Eucalyptus Avenue. The APNs are shown on the slide there. The zone change would modify the zoning designation on two of the three parcels from mixed use 30 to specific plan implementation in the downtown specific plan within the Civic Center District. This zone change would be required to develop the site with a commercial and residential mixed use project at the density that's proposed by the applicant. Next slide, please. The project location is shown here. Uh, it's three parcels. It's the corner parcel uh, at the southwest corner of Civic Center and Eucalyptus, as well as the two residential parcels behind at 209 and 211. And uh, Kathy, if you click there, it'll show a red area over the two residential parcels that would require the rezone. So the corner, corner parcel is currently in the downtown specific plan and enjoys a higher density and fewer development standard restrictions than the two residential parcels which are in the mixed use zone. So the applicant is requesting to change the zoning designation on the two parcels in red to match the zoning that's at the corner so that they could develop it as one comprehensive project. Next slide, please. The existing and proposed zoning is shown here. You can see the corner parcel is designated downtown Vista specific plan on the left with the two residential lots designated as mixed use 30. The proposal would be to rezone all three parcels or the two so that all three parcels would be within the downtown Vista specific plan. Next slide. The applicant has submitted a conceptual development plan, which was provided in your packet. This is a site plan for the ground floor. He's requesting to develop a mixed use commercial and residential project where you would have two commercial suites on the ground floor, each totaling about 1500 square feet, parking behind the commercial suites with three stories of residential above the parking garage. The total uh, unit count would be 24 units in the proposal that was submitted with access on both Eucalyptus and Civic Center Drive. Next slide, please. This is an architectural rendering that was submitted by the applicant to give the council some idea of the scale and architectural theme of the project. If the council supports uh, the rezone request, then the applicant would be required to submit a formal application that would go through design review with staff before it's brought back to the planning commission and the council for a final decision. So this is just to give you some idea of the vision for the site if the zone change is supported. Next slide. The zoning standards are shown here. Um, sorry, the slide got a little lower than what's uh, on it, but essentially uh, showing the difference between the density, building height, setbacks, and parking. The density in the MU zone is lower than what's in the Civic Center zone, so this is what's precipitating the request for the zone change, 30 versus 40 DU per acre. The building height in the mixed-use zone is lower at three stories or 45 feet. The downtown specific plan allows up to 60 feet in height. The setbacks in the mixed-use zone are fairly significant in the Civic Center um, district, requiring 15 feet in the front, 15 feet abutting residential zones, which are behind, and 25 feet above the second story of the structure. In the Civic Center zone, in the downtown specific plan, there's a five foot front setback and a 15 foot rear setback with zero sides. So larger building envelope is provided. And finally, with respect to parking, the parking standards in the mixed use zone are what our normal multifamily standards are, which is 2.3 for a one bedroom or 2.5 for a two bedroom. In the Civic Center, there are lower standards, recognizing you're closer to transit opportunities, a one bedroom at 1.25 parking spaces per unit and a two bedroom at 2.25 spaces per unit. That includes your guest spaces. Next slide. 
Uh, so the staff request uh, the zone changes and general plan amendments are always brought before the council at the initial stage to gauge uh, the council's interest in the application. A formal application would be required dependent on the council's direction. Uh, the formal application would be reviewed by the planning commission and the council at the time that it's submitted. So we're asking the council to weigh in on this request this evening and provide staff with any input as well as the applicant on the preliminary request for zone change. So that completes my staff presentation, Mayor. And I know the applicant is also uh, prepared to provide a brief presentation to the council. And the applicant is Kevin Leon, who's the project manager, as well as Mark Lyon, who's the architect, and Phil Salvaggio, who's the owner. And I believe Mr. Leon is planning to make the presentation. Madam Mayor, City Council members, uh, good evening. My name is Mark Lyon. I'm the architect. <coughs> I'm representing Mr. and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Salvaggio, the owners of the property located in the southwest corner of Eucalyptus and Civic Center Drive. Um, thank you, Mr. Conley, for the presentation, and I apologize to you if I repeat some of the information that Mr. Conley's given you. We're here simply to ask for your assistance in the first step of the development of this property. We'll see that we have a couple of difficulties uh, on the development for this particular lot. Uh, the second slide, please. Thank you. As you can see, we have three parcels uh, purchased individually. The two at the bottom were purchased together, but they are of a different zone. If you could go to slide three, please. Thank you. And again, this is a duplication, so I apologize. But the uh, lot one, which is the top SP1, is in the downtown Vista specific plan in the Civic Center zone. And the two lots below are located in the MU30 mixed use zone. We've been told by planning department we have to consolidate these lots. And it's required that we consolidate them into the most restrictive zone, which would be the MU. We're simply asking that um, the city council allow us to consolidate them into the least restrictive zone. Uh, and I'll show you why that is. Could you go to slide number four, please? Thank you. Uh, by the way, the, the downtown Vista specific plan land use map, if you can see the red circle, those three lots are located in that zone, in the DVSP zone. So the documentation and the handouts who were approved by city council back in 2018, I believe, show those three lots to be uh, in one zone and in the least restrictive zone. Mr. Salvaggio purchased those lots with the intention of developing in, you know, a mixed use zone based on some of these maps that we've seen that they're open to the public. Could you go to slide five, please? Thank you. The consolidated lot area of three parcels is 40,000 155 square feet, almost an acre. Based on that lot size, Mr. Salvaggio is allowed to build either 36 or 27 apartment units, depending on which zone you refer to. We wish to build 24 units. On its face, this sounds great. However, what determines the develop developability of this property is the parking required. Required parking for 24 units on the DVSP zone is 52. Required parking for 24 units under the MU30 zone is 73. You can see there's a substantial difference in the required parking for 24 units. Based on the size and configuration, we can only fit 52 parking spaces on this lot. Keep in mind, we also are providing parking for two commercial retail spaces at the street. Based on the MU30 zone, the most restrictive zone, Mr. Salvaggio can only build 15 units unless we build an underground parking lot, which is both cost prohibitive and probably not the best solution for this corner lot. Based on the DVSP zone, which is the most lenient, 52 parking spaces will allow Mr. Salvaggio to build his 24 units. 
much closer to the intended density of the lots. Let me repeat that under the restrictive zone, this project is really not feasible. Under the least restrictive zone, it is. So difficulty number two, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Right. So these are three pictures of the property at the corner. And um, as you can see, it's a very special property. We're right across the street from the city hall and it's at a prime intersection in the city of Z in Vista. Uh, you can also see that <laughs> we've got some challenges with the steepness of this site. This is also creating problems with the parking. Um, could you go to slide number seven, please? Thank you. This is a section through the lot. And as you can see, the dotted line is the natural topography. The dark lines are the structural floors and walls of the proposed building. And you can see that the second level has to be raised up because we have to get the driveways to fit on this lot and stay within the standards for slopes of driveways and ability to get handicap accessibility and things like that incorporated. So zone MU30, which is the most restrictive, allows a maximum height limit of 45 feet. The DVSP zone, the least restrictive, requires a maximum height limit of 60 feet. Our proposed project is 49 feet. And again, most of the compl complexity of that height limit is due to that first level of parking and the driveway slopes. We just need a few more feet above 45 feet to get this to fit. Could you go to slide eight, please? Thank you. We're very excited about the proposed design and would love the opportunity to create a vibrant and active community plaza and mixed use center to support the city hall facility across the street. We respectfully request the city council make a very simple decision. Please allow Mr. Salvaggio to develop this project under the DVSP zoning designation, which is the designation which makes the project feasible. Could you go to slide number nine, please? This is again from the handout and pamphlets that we received prior to building the project or proposing to build a project. And as you can see, those three lots are all included in the same uh, DVSP zone. Uh, we believe that was the intention of the council when they approved the downtown specific plan use plan in 2018. And there was even an ordinance, it's 2018-14. And you can see in the exhibit, it appears it was the city's original intention to include those three parcels in the lesser restrictive zone of the DVSP. Thank you very much for allowing to make this presentation. Okay, so with that, House Member Franklin. So I don't know if staff needs time to research the question, but um, if we approve that map and that uh, specific zone uh, with those parcels highlighted, is it the fact that the council has already changed the zone on that uh, on those two parcels, and that we just simply haven't caught up uh, and recorded them? No, I, I was not actually aware that the land use map that's in the downtown Vista specific plan included those two lots until the presentation tonight. Frankly, um, our official zoning map that was approved by the council shows the correct zoning and we have clarified for the applicant what the correct zoning is. Very good. Other, other, House member Green. All right, so I have lived in this district, worked in this district for over 25 years. Uh, I know that slope very well because I used to own a Huffy bike that I used to be able to pedal up that hill to those jumps on top of that hill, okay? So I'm very familiar with your lot. I'm actually familiar with both of the properties. Um, the other thing that I'm familiar with is our zoning and our general plan, unfortunately. And at right at this point right now, we have a lot of new projects being built. I'm not sure how familiar you are with our town, but we got the Monarch development going in where we used to have an old trailer park. We got a 55 plus development going in uh, on the other side of Civic Center Drive. And we really haven't seen the focused impacts from those developments yet because they're not built yet. People don't all live in them yet. Also, we approved Delphi Corner, which is 
is another big project. So we have a lot of stuff going on. Um, I'm not sure why I didn't speak with you guys before. For your presentation, typically before builders come and present to the council, they want to speak to us first to kind of hear what our opinion is on it. Um, I personally have no plans of changing the zoning and my general plan right now. I feel like just recently this council changed the zoning on Civic Center Drive to this zoning to allow densification on this particular street. Um, so I have the question to Mr. Conley. I know I know why you want it, Mr. Lyon. I see that you you get. 21 less parking spots if I change the zoning, and that's obviously better for a developer. However, until I see what's going on with these other developments that are meeting our criteria and haven't asked us to do a lot of uh, you know, changing of our plan, what that does, I'm not inclined at all to approve this project or advise you to spend any more money at this point in time. Um, but I would like to ask Mr. Conley, when did us as a council review the zoning here on Civic Center Drive? Because I know we put a lot of thought into this zoning and I believe it was changed within the last four years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the zoning on Civic Center Drive was established around 2015 when we adopted the last update to the downtown specific plan and we had a discussion on uh, setbacks and density, I believe a year later in 2016. That's my okay, and that had to do with kind of the corridor near Crescent and Civic Center Drive and things like that. I know we have a we also have a couple other developments on Civic Center Drive, the old music shop and uh, another you know house over there that I think they're building another little development over there. So the the zoning that's in there currently is conducive for investors to build, and that is kind of the the furthest point of our downtown specific plan. And I'll tell you what, sir, I don't know if you've been here when school gets out um, at that corner or not, but the amount of traffic improvements that would have to be done on that corner just to release the funnel of cars that come through there every single day would be extremely extensive. I mean, if you you know take it the high traffic hours, you're going to see when school's in session and city hall's going on. I mean, there's times I wait in the city hall parking lot to leave between the hours of 2.30 and 3.15 for like 40 minutes. And that it's a lot of traffic there. So me personally, right now, until I see what the focused impacts are of all of these other developments, I have no intention of changing the zoning. And I would appreciate if my council would follow my lead on that for this particular lot. Thank you for your time. Well, I like the architectural design and I would love to see something go on that corner, but I, I'm not willing to, with the apartments that are built and all the people that are parking on the street because there's not enough parking in, in, our, in, in a lot of our developments, I, I, wouldn't, I, I would have to use a mixed use zoning because I the higher parking restrictions. And I don't, there, but there's lots behind those three lots. There's down on uh, Eucalyptus maybe, I don't know if you can buy a couple of those lots and use some parking down there, but I, I wouldn't be willing to change the, those lots, those mixed use, because I, I want the higher parking requirements on those. So, but I, but I like, I mean, I like your design and, and I like the idea of, of having that corner cleaned up. But I might, and I do realize there's challenges with that, that the hills and everything there. So anyway, that, that's, those are my comments. Anybody else? I'm not seeing anybody waving at me. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Lyon. I appreciate it very much. Um, I have to agree with my colleagues, however. Um, I'm not in favor of rezoning this area. We've recently gone through very extensively to uh, put the zoning where we think it's appropriate. And I'm not in favor of rezoning it. And I'm certainly, anybody who's been following along uh, with me the last few years knows that I'm not in favor of reducing parking requirements because that ends up pushing a problem out into the surrounding communities, the surrounding neighborhoods, and that's that doesn't usually end well. So I appreciate this. I agree with the mayor. I like the look of it. I'm just not going to be in favor of rezoning and reducing parking. But Good luck, and maybe we can see you come back with something different. Anybody else? Um, Mayor, it looks like Mr. Salvaggio would like to make a comment. Oh, okay. Party owner, would you like to hear from him now? Okay. okay. Uh, yes, this is Mr. Salvaggio. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'll just be real quick. The only reason I bought the other two lots is because it was in that zone. So I was going to the map. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have spent that money 
if I knew this was going to happen. And um, unfortunately, you know, this is going to put a big wrench into the project. And and now it puts a bad position on myself. So um, I only went off to original map and that's what it says on there. And um, I don't want to cause any trouble, but that's what it does say. Okay, do I, oh, Councilmember Contreras, I think you waved at me before he spoke. Yeah, you know what, I don't, I actually don't have that much to add um, because I agree with all the comments that have made, uh, been made already. Um, I think the plan looks beautiful. It just doesn't seem entirely feasible with the amount of congestion that uh, this area already experiences. Um, and I do appreciate Councilmember Green um, the point that you made that, hey, you know what, we have a lot of moving parts right now, and it would be good to uh, follow, you know, what we have uh, in our plan right now. Uh, eventually, you know, whatever council will look at that, and if there needs to be updates, that would be the proper time to do so. Um, as of now, uh, yeah, I, I would not be supportive um, either. Uh, of doing a, uh, a zone change to capture it all as the specific plan, the downtown specific plan. So those are my comments. Okay, so yes, Councilmember Green. I just had a question. Mr. Salvaggio stated that he only purchased this property because he has a map or was provided with a map that stated this was in his downtown specific plan. For that, perhaps this is a question for you, uh, Mr. Piper. Um, is there any such map on file that as a city we have provided a home buyer doing their due diligence that was incorrect information? And if we did provide that map to a homeowner, what type of liability are we exposed to if we don't honor the map that was provided? Um, I, I just want to know where who, where'd the map come from? Wh wh did we give it to them and all that good stuff? So let me know whoever could answer that. <laughs> Map came from or how it was distributed, Mr. Conley might have better information on that. So the map it appears is the land use map that's included in the downtown specific plan that was adopted by the council the last time the plan was updated. Um, but yeah, unfortunately it shows those two properties in the plan when they're not in the plan. So wasn't caught by staff when the map was approved the map needs to be revised and those lots need to be taken off. But does the official zoning map, as I indicated, that the city uses and recognizes and is in our GIS system and also available on the city's website, shows the correct zoning. So yes, there's a correction that needs to be made, but had the applicant come and talk to us at any point, we would have clarified what the zoning was. So okay. to correct what's happened, but the map is... Yeah. That's in okay. the is not correct. So, so from a liability standpoint, it sounds like we're not exposed to any liability. The buyer had they done their due diligence within the period and said, hey, I'm going to be building a development here. I better check with the city before I close escrow. Everybody in our planning department would have been able to easily look at the GIS map and easily tell him, yes, those two properties are mixed use. They are separate. So from a liability standpoint, we're fine is was my question. We have not given, they have not paid any fee or submitted any application, nor have we given any approval based on incorrect zoning information. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Councilmember Franklin. Uh, doesn't our GS, GIS information integrate with the commercial MLS system? No, not to my knowledge. In other words, the, the MLS is separate and apart from our GIS. It may be relied upon for MLS, but it's not linked in any way. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking the the ML the CoStar, the commercial MLS, probably buys a uh, a disc from us once a year or something. So the GIS information that's provided, if that comes from our database, is correct. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not a realtor. I don't. I don't know a lot about that. But uh, I know that the uh, land use designation is uh, generally. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, our real estate professionals, but uh, generally, the commercial uh, MLS would provide that information, wouldn't it? Yes. The, the other thing to note is that the applicant has a slide <laughs> presentation that shows the correct zoning. So. 
they're aware of what the correct zoning is. I understand if the owner purchased the land looking at the map, but I can't change that now. I can only affect what happens moving forward with the property. So A, the staff will change the map immediately that's in the specific plan so that we avoid this issue in the future. I wasn't aware there was a problem there, so my apology. But B, we haven't taken anything from the applicant other than some fees to review this plan. And they have been informed of what the correct zoning is. That's why they're before you tonight. Okay, so I don't see any other. Um, so do we need, do we, don't need um, do we need a motion on this city manager? Do we need a, um, or is it just a discussion? This is an advisory item, Mayor, so I don't think there's any vote required. The council's given the applicant their feedback. Okay. Oh. That is correct. Okay, so then with that, we will, um, that's our answers, and, and we will move on to the next um, discussion item. Um, so our, la our next one, our last one, is a proclamation of Constitution Week in the City of Vista, and Deputy Mayor Rigby... I'm asked for this one to be put on the agenda, so I'm going to ask her to introduce the item. And if any members of the public wish to speak on this item, they may indicate so by using the raise hand feature or pressing star nine now. Speakers will be called upon after the presentation. So I'll turn it over to Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a proclamation that we do every year. Um, a while back, uh, Congress passed a resolution acknowledging September 17th to the 23rd as Constitution Week annually. And uh, the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution requests this um, proclamation to recognize uh, Constitution Week here in the city of Vista. And every year, this year, not, not because of COVID, but every year uh, we do a display at the library with different books and uh, movies and different things uh, showing the history of the United States and the Constitution, the writing of the Constitution and things like that. So um, because we are doing our proclamations differently now with presenting them at a council meeting for signature, I am here before you um, asking that uh, the proclamation I'm about to read be approved and um, submitted. So the proclamation reads, whereas 233 years ago, our founding fathers gathered in Philadelphia and set our country on a bold course toward forming a more perfect union by drafting the United States Constitution, framing our nation's government. And whereas on September 17th and during the week of September 17th through the 23rd, we celebrate the signing of the Constitution and the American citizens who have devoted their lives to implementing the framers vision for a nation built on the principles of self-government. Whereas the founders understood that a self-governing republic requires a free and empowered citizenry, we are therefore grateful that our constitution is designed first and foremost to secure liberty. Through a system of limited government and checks and balances, the constitution limits the ability of the state to become an obstacle of human flourishing while simultaneously enabling the state to serve the public good and to protect rights. Whereas the framers of our constitution were committed not to a king or a particular government, but more to a belief in the promise of America as a free and prosperous society. To fulfill that promise, they designed a government with a constitution that would withstand the inevitable demo demagoguery, passions and exigencies that would seek to unmask us as a people. And though the durability of our constitution has been tested through crises and wars, it has endured. Whereas it is a privilege and the duty of the American people to commemorate the ratification of the constitution, the guardian of our liberties, which embodies the principles of limited government in a republic dedicated to the rule of law. Whereas the mayor and members of the Vista City Council recognize the magnitude of the constitution and the unparalleled success of the system of government it helped create. And we recommit ourselves to the enduring principles of the constitution and thereby secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the members of the Vista City Council do hereby proclaim the week of September 17th through the 23rd, 
2020 in the city of Vista as Constitution Week. And we ask our citizens to reaffirm the ideals of the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties, remembering that lost rights may never be regained. So with that, Madam Mayor, I would move that we approve this proclamation claiming September 17th to the 23rd to be Constitution Week in the city of Vista. And just on a side note, anybody who knows me knows I have constitutions all over the place. I have them in my purse. I give them out freely. I have stacks of them in my office. I give them out to anybody who comes to City Hall and visits or asks for one. So if you would like your own pocket constitution, just give me a call or come by City Hall. I have one for you. So thank you, Madam Mayor. And I look forward to my colleagues' comments. I'm mute. Council Member Franklin, sorry. <laughs> I am so excited to second your motion, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I never am far from my <laughs> constitution. Uh, I, I love both of these uh, different copies. They have many different copies of the constitution. I'm a big fan. Uh, we are the oldest Republican democracy in the history of the world. And that is because of our founding fathers, and the ingenious document that they gave us, the charter for our government, which established a system of balances, uh, checks and balances uh, with the, the three different branches. Um, what a proud legacy uh, that they left us, that we would be able to govern ourselves peacefully, that we would be able to transition power peacefully from uh, from different parties and, and schools of thought which disagree vehemently about how government should be run uh, to the core and the fiber they're being disagree about the size of government and, and how government should function, that we position power uh, and that we can make decisions in a civilized manner uh, and that we have been able to do that longer than any other Republican democracy in history is just incredible. Uh, and so I am so proud uh, to second your motion. Thank you so much for offering this uh, proclamation and resolution. So um, we have to do a vote on this one? We do, don't we? No. Yes. Yes, yes, you do. And do we have any speakers um, with our city clerk? Do we have any speakers on this issue? There are no speakers, so we'll close the opportunity for public comment at this time. Okay. Well, I think Councilman Green wants to speak. And so maybe, is Councilman Contreras. Yeah. She seems to be making me making motion. So I'll go with Councilman Contreras first and then Councilman Green. Sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> Actually, I was like, you know, a council member, he's below me. So I was trying to, <laughs> I don't know what the order is like, but I just want to say, um, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor uh, Rigby, for bringing this forward. Um, it, you know, I mean, we have gone through a lot um, as a nation, and we continue to face very difficult challenges. Uh, but what, you know, unites us is our belief in our Constitution and our founding um, documents and the founding framework of this beautiful nation. So um, I look forward to the many more years that we get to celebrate um, being a, a great country um, and becoming a more perfect union. Uh, so thank you again for bringing this uh, forward to the council. I'm very supportive of it. Councilmember Green. Thank you, and thank you, Councilmember Contreras, for pointing at me. I appreciate it. I just again wanted to say thank you, Deputy Mayor Rigby, for just bringing this before us. Uh, our oath of office says that we will defend our Constitution and fight for our Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And uh, the Constitution of the United States, as uh, Councilmember Franklin said, is the document that we live by, that uh, we, we govern by. And regardless of our parties, uh, there are core beliefs here 
in the United States of America. And the city of Vista uh, proclaiming Constitution Week is just another testament to our patriotism here in the city of Vista. And our patriotism is Americans, man. No country on this planet I would ever live in. And I'll tell you what, no city in the world I would ever live in than Vista, California. And I've been to a lot of them. This is where you want to be. And with a council like I have and a thoughtfulness of my deputy mayor, mayor and council members, man, best meeting of 2020. Can I just say this? Anyway, mad love, Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much. Roll call vote. What? <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And Kathy Valdez, our city clerk, would you do a roll call vote for us? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mayor Ritter. Yes. Deputy Mayor Rigby. Absolutely. Yes. Councilmember Franklin. Definitely. Councilmember Green. 1,000% yes. Councilmember Contreras. Aye, yes. The item passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And next year, when the library is open again, <laughs> uh, come by and look at the display that we do and the interaction that we have with our library patrons on the history of the Constitution. So I invite you all. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next on our agenda, we have an opportunity for the public to comment on agency-related matters that are not on the agenda. So if any members of the public wish to address the city council, they may indicate so by using the raise hand feature or by pressing star nine now. So City Clerk Valdez, do we have any members of the public that wish for communication? Yes, we have one. Cliff Kaiser, I'm going to go ahead and let him in. Go ahead, Cliff. Green Council again. Um, I love this format. Um, you should have done it before we had the virus. Uh, it allows, or at least the opportunity for more participation. I do have a couple of uh, thoughts about it though. Um, I've been to a couple of the commission meetings and in, in this meeting, the link that shows up in the agendas on the county and the city's website just plain doesn't work. Um, I got obviously into this meeting uh, directly from Zoom entering the codes and stuff like that, but the link doesn't work. Two reasons. One is it doesn't get translated correctly when it goes to PDF and there's a bunch of spaces in it, but then we, even if you fix that, it still doesn't work. Um, I think that if you could allow chat or consider allowing chat messages to come in instead of just raising the hand, that may allow a little bit more input or a little bit more screening if you, if you need that, but it, it seems like it could streamline some comments a little bit. And I would also ask, and I'm, and I'm sure that you guys are getting a lot of learning process from this, 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 this effort in doing this, but consider having the public allow in uh, on video as well. So we can see, you can see, and others can see the dramatic hand motions and facial expressions that I have similar to Mr. Green and Mr. Contreras. All right, have a great day. Thank you. And that's our only speaker? Yes, so we'll uh, close the opportunity for public comment. Okay, Okay. with that, that takes us to remarks. And I have a few here and then I'll pass it down to everyone else. Um, a couple things, the Vista Library is offering walk-up door side service. No appointment is needed. You can request, our customers can request library materials by phone or online, and they will be notified when their items are ready. So visit sdcl.org for details on that. If you haven't completed the 2020 census, there's still time to respond online at 2020census.gov. Census takers are now visiting homes that have not yet responded. All census takers will have valid ID badges with their photo. Call the bilingual hotline at 760-659-0190 if you have questions. And one other thing, registration for the city's preschool program has started. The classes are for ages 12 months to five years and have safety precautions in place for students and staff. So visit um, vistarecreation.com for more information on that. And just one other thing, I just wanted to know that um, the, the, the four mayors and myself, all five of us wrote a letter to the governor asking them to um, let any business that can follow protocols, healthy protocols, to open up, not just by specific businesses, by naming the specific businesses, but anybody that can follow safely the protocols that are put forth, whatever the business might be, whether it be a hairdresser, a bar barber, whatever it is, if they can follow the protocols, and many of them can, 
that they should be able to open up all businesses. So anyway, we wrote a letter. I don't know where it'll go, but we wrote that to Governor Newsom, and we'll see if we get a response for that. Oh, also, um, the, we had our two supervisors sign that also, Supervisor Desmond and Supervisor Gaspar. So that, those are my announcements. So I will go through and ask everybody what their announcements are. So we will start with, let's see, I'm going to go the, line up on the screen here. I'll start with Council Member Green. I didn't know the lineup, so thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just want to thank my amazing council for a great discussion um, and just the research that you do, the information that you guys bring. It's always enlightening to uh, sit next to you guys and work with you, so I really appreciate that. I just want to give one more shout out to our city employees. We didn't all get to congratulate them individually after their proclamations. The fact that they get their own days in Vista, goodness gracious, someday I aspire to have Joe Green Day. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to keep going real hard one day. Come on. Even my grandma has a day in Vista. Anyway, sorry. Aldo Hernandez, Chris Arce, and Laura Mead. Aldo Hernandez, not only is he awesome in an employee standpoint, but he is the dodgeball champion in the city right now. That's right. Took me out in dodgeball. Not a fan. Laura Mead has the best candy in City Hall. So if you go to HR, she's hiding chocolate there. You can get it. And Chris Arce is just a hardworking guy, great to talk to, represents our city amazingly. So from Council Member Green, I know my whole council, thank you city employees for shining so bright around town. We appreciate you. You're more than employees to us, you're family. So thanks for working so hard for the city of Vista. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Franklin. I, I got so excited there, I almost looked underneath my chair. <laughs> Uh, I would second everything that uh, Councilman Green said to our great staff, especially those who were uh, honored this evening. Thanks for your dedication and commitment to the city. Uh, thanks to all of our employees. Uh, thanks to uh, all of uh, you, my fellow council members, uh, for all your hard work. I appreciate it. And to all the great people of Vista who tuned in tonight and those who didn't, we appreciate them too. Councilmember Contreras. Yeah, just again, uh, thank you to all my coworkers. You guys make, uh, you know, the city of Vista run um, and you provide us uh, all the information that we could ever ask for and more sometimes <laughs> when it comes to making our decisions. Uh, so thank you so much. And it's great that we get to honor uh, the hard work that you all do on a daily basis. And again, just want to thank my, my colleagues. Uh, we always have great discussions um, and we do our, our darn best, uh, you know, for the city of Vista. So I appreciate all the hard work that goes, uh, into these meetings. Um, and other than that, uh, it's been hot. So make sure you're drinking tons of water, um, stay in the shade if you can. And, uh, also, even though it's super hot, we're still doing our trash pickups every Wednesday. So we meet at 9am at Luz Duran, come sweat a few calories out. Help us pick up some trash and um, keep Vista looking beautiful. So outside of that, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your night. And uh, maybe it'll cool down just a little bit more, hopefully. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Rigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to echo uh, my colleagues. Thank you for staff and all the work that you put into everything that comes before us. And thank you to everybody who emailed and uh, made phone calls and commented tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate hearing from all of you. And we might not always agree on the council. We don't always agree, but I, I love the discussion. I love the discourse. I love that we have the opportunity to come out here together as one people of Vista um, and have these discussions. And I appreciate you very, very much. And I'm one of the things that I have he been hearing from people about, I've received a few letters, I think we all have, regarding the litter along the freeway and the on-ramp, off-ramp areas surrounding the freeways. And this is something that we as a city, we have approached Caltrans before. Um, even in, in past times, not just during the COVID-19 shutdown, but in past times, I know uh, Councilman Franklin and I went down along with, I think our city manager went with us to Caltrans to talk about some issues with Caltrans and litter was, was one of the problems as well then. Um, but it has become such a problem. And I know that when we contacted Caltrans a while back, they said, and this 
I'm just going to put this right out there. It just blew my mind that they said this, that in the midst of a global health pandemic, the trash piling up on the freeway was not an issue for them and they weren't going to address it. Um, it just didn't make any sense to me because as we know, trash and litter can be a health problem uh, for us. So it has become such a problem and we are not the only community who has noticed this problem and is having issues with it. So at SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments, in which all 19 jurisdictions, the 18 cities and the county, uh, have seats at the table, we have created a litter abatement committee to directly address this countywide through all of the agencies, including Caltrans. And I have been appointed as the representative for the North County um, inland area and our city. And we're going to be having our first meeting uh, down in San Diego next week. So I will keep everybody apprised of how that goes. I want to say thank you for calling us. Thank you for letting us know that you see it as well. We see it, we've been working on it, and we will continue to work on it. And thank you to everybody who goes out and picks up litter. I appreciate that very much. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. City Manager Patrick Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and talking about Caltrans, uh, Caltrans staff was precluded from the state from picking up trash on the freeway uh, up until the end of June, I believe. And it was disappointing to see that they they did go through the 78 corridor. They did clean up the trash. They cleaned up the weeds at the beginning of July. And literally a week later, uh, it it took on a much different look and continues to. And we at the staff level have contacted Caltrans and asked them to uh, do further cleanups on the 78, specifically in Vista. I do want to thank the council for your comments on city staff as a whole. And I do want to congratulate Laura and Chris. And although they are truly great representatives of the city and uh, very well deserving of the awards that they uh, received. A couple updates. Um, the city is temporarily, uh, excuse me, the city's temporary rent and emergency relief program. This is the one that you all approve via the homeless strategic plan for those that are experiencing hardship during this COVID time. Um, <clears throat> the program will begin on August 31st and it is done through Lifeline. So if people are interested, uh, they can go to nclifeline.org and get more information, but it does begin on uh, August 31st for the application period. I did want to let everybody know that street sweeping enforcement is going to resume again in Vista. It'll start on September 8th um, and starting next week and the following week, we'll be going out and giving warnings on cars that um, violate the street sweeping code and to let them know that uh, on September 8th, the program will once again resume from an enforcement standpoint. And the last thing that I wanted to mention was that we do have um, our fire personnel out um, on a few of the fires that are out there. We have uh, two city crews that are out of the area. One is at the Sheep Fire in Lassen County, and the other is at the Lightning Complex Fire uh, near Santa Cruz. So um, we have two crews out there, that's eight individuals. We also have a PIO that's been assigned to the Lightning Complex Fire. We also have a radio operator at the Woodward Fire. So um, our thoughts are with them and hopefully uh, we see them back safe soon and the fires are out for the folks in Northern California. And that's all I have, thank you, Mayor. And City Attorney, Daryl Piper, do you have anything tonight? I have nothing special to add this evening, thank you, Mayor. About our city clerk, Kathy Valdez, anything? Nothing to add, thank you. Okay, and with that, I see nobody else. I will adjourn us. Thanks, everybody. Good night.